everyone, and welcome back to Through Time and Clades. My name is Joan. And I'm Albert. And oh, today we got a special episode for y'all. Um, so even though Humanity a Prologue has finished, um, the field of paleoanthropology certainly has it. And so we are here almost a year later after the first episode premiere of this series for our update special. Yay! Yeah, um... But before we jump into that, uh, Albert, how are things on your end? I've been all right. I've been very busy with uh, a lot of different things. Um, yeah, especially uh, so about the thesis writing and also just stuff with life in general. But um, uh, you know, I think uh, I think the break that we took did a lot of good, and um, I'm certainly um, looking forward to see what you have prepared for this update episode. Because of course, um, as we've um, mentioned countless times, uh, paleoanthropology is a really fast moving field so i'm sure there's been a lot of new stuff that has come up since uh, you covered them on your series um and so yeah i'm really excited to see all these new advances and um i guess um our plan i think is to release these update episodes uh, about once a year or so right yeah i think so um i mean in between any possible paleo study studies that i want to cover during our regular news episodes um these these update specials will help tie things closer to things that we've already talked about on this show. And uh, I think doing it yearly would probably be for the best. It gives enough time for things to accumulate in case there's really big changes. And uh, um, it'll help me kind of pick which ones are the most relevant to things we've talked about mm -hmm. on Humanity of Prologue. Um, so, yeah, I, I think doing this yearly would be the best idea for us. Um, we're open to critiques on that <laughs> by our viewers of course <laughs> right um, but yeah uh let's see on my end of things uh there's a new bbc natural history series that just released um last week that uh, i got the chance to watch um for those of you who are regular viewers of bbc america or amc um we now have eden untamed planet which is basically a look at various places around the world where the human impact on the environment, and that's generally through time, has not been extensive enough to completely transform the region. And so you're basically looking at places where you could call them fairly protected areas with large amounts of wildlife that are still unfragmented and uh, are doing fairly okay populations-wise. Um, which is an interesting look. So, like, each episode stays in one place rather than giving you sort of a, a panoply of similar ecosystems as these series tend to do. Um, so, like, you have a Grasslands episode, a Jungles episode. Well, here it's like, oh, the first episode is on Borneo, the island of Borneo in Southeast Asia. And, uh, I mean, it's a BBC natural history documentary, so you know the cinematography is going to be amazing. And it has been. Um, there's some really wonderful footage of orangutans and there's a whole sequence of proboscis monkeys uh, trying to jump over a river to get to another branch but there's a big saltwater crocodile in the water and <laughs> so it's all dramatic right um and uh, uh albert i know you haven't gotten the chance to see this yet because in sort of a weird like reversal right. they're airing it in the u.s first and yes. then airing it in the uk <laughs> right right so <laughs> that's yeah, that's right. So I haven't been able to see it, see it yet, but um, from uh, what you've been saying, it certainly sounds amazing. And uh, I know there's at, um, at least one of the uh, clips from the episode has been released for um, worldwide audiences on the BBC um, YouTube channel. And um, I definitely saw that going around quite a bit um, over the past week um, on my social media. And it, it's definitely a really cool piece of footage. It is um, showing um, uh, hornbills and also hawks, but um, I think... Uh, probably more surprising to most viewers would be the hornbills um, like going after um, uh, bats um, that are flying past them in this tree and so they just kind of reach out and use their huge bills to grab the bats right out of the air um, which is really cool and uh, of course uh, if you've been following my series on birds we did mention that uh, hornbills um, despite often being thought of as primarily fruit eating birds uh, they are quite uh, effective uh, predators of smaller animals and uh, I think that segment certainly shows that very well. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, in fact, I believe 
this is the first time that this behavior has actually been filmed for that species in particular. Mm, it might be, yeah. Which, uh, that's always fun when they do this sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I definitely enjoyed it. Um, it's narrated by Elena Bottom Carter, who I'm sure you might be aware of if you've watched any like Tim Burton movies or whatever. Um, rather than David Attenborough for a change, which <laughs> right. is, I mean, which is which is good. She's a really good narrator. Mm -hmm. um, she kind of like, has fun with some of the scenes. Like there, there's a whole sequence with a sun bear, mm. which is the smallest species of bear. Right, that, uh, is primarily a. Uh, well, I wouldn't say primarily. It's it eats insects a lot. Yeah. Um, but I mentioned it's, it's probably about as omnivorous as all the other bears. But um, it one of its favorite foods is honey, and mm. so it's. Mm having to climb trees to get at the bee's nest but the thing is like it can't do like the vertical clinging and leaping like primates do so right. it can't like hop from tree to tree it has to go up the tree and if it's not the right one it has to come down and go up another tree and if that's not the right one they gotta repeat <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a whole sequence it's really fun um but yeah she's there and she's talking about oh it's not quite right it's, like, <laughs> Let's try again. <laughs> it's, it's cute it's fun yeah um, and of course like as always like they do make a point to mention the environmental issues of borneo hmm. um i think it's safe to say out of all the, the the regions that they are supposed to be talking about through this series um i think they're going to do episodes on like the galapagos and like, namibia and so forth um this is the one that probably is like highest on the radar at the moment hmm. as far as like environmental destruction because borneo famously has been going through a lot of deforestation right and um it's a really troubling concern but uh, they, they do bring up these sorts of issues, which is good because it's good to get that information out there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, uh, I'm i barely pleased with it and I'm looking forward to seeing where that's going to go next. Um, if anyone is interested in the United States who wants to catch up with it, um, new episodes are Saturdays at 8 p.m. on BBC America and AMC. But if you want to catch a previous episode um, on Fridays at the same time, I believe they're going to re-air like past episodes so you hmm. can get caught up and and see this i mean this amazing wildlife footage um which is just you know one of the things that's to come because bbc america um well bbc has a bunch of shows planned for the near future um we're getting a sequel to frozen planet um they're doing planet earth three um which i'm curious if they'll kind of um and this is kind of going a little bit deep into things i hope they'll they'll look at the um critiques of planet earth 2 and uh, maybe try to work those into this new one hmm. and you know kind of the way that they did with blue planet 2, that's right which was a, a massive improvement on that front um and then we're also getting green planet which hmm. i believe is their first major series in a while on plants i think so yeah thing, which is that's always a nice change of pace definitely um, I remember, uh, I've not seen it in full yet, but I've seen plenty of clips from The Private Life of Plants, yes. which was part of that in Burroughs' big life series, where that was all dedicated to plants. Yeah. The, the backstory behind that series is really fun. Because, um, the, so there's a documentary, Life on Air, about David Attenborough's early life in TV and, and natural history. And he was talking about how he always wanted to go to this mountain. And I want to say it's, near paradise falls mm. um somewhere in south america but it's like this famous mountain not a lot of people go up there but he's always wanted to go because there's all kinds of like endemic plants that only live on top of this mountain um but he didn't have a justification to go up there and like spend money on doing it <laughs> so he managed to convince the network to order several hours of documentary footage on plants <laughs> so he could go to this mountain to talk about the plants that's amazing oh <laughs> uh, which is just it's just a it's just a perfect Attenborough moment right yeah, there. Yeah, <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> but um yeah, that's basically what I've been up to. Um really looking forward to future episodes in that series for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, so okay. Uh we're gonna be doing things a bit differently in this Humanity a Prologue special, um, if you might not be aware. Um it's going to look more like one of our news episodes mm. than anything else, you know. Uh, I'm going to go in chronological order through the different episodes of this series and pinpoint studies from the past year that A, add additional information to a discussed topic, B, highlight new insights that validate, invalidate, or supplement information to discussed topics, mm -hmm. 
and C, overturn key themes and concepts in this series. Um, yeah, now in general, there's going to be more of A and B than C, but all three are represented here. Hmm. Um, so yeah, without further ado, let's jump in. Sure thing. Um, let's go to our next slide. Uh, so first up, uh, we have a couple of interesting stories regarding more distant relatives mm. among the primates uh, and beyond uh, in regards to a February 2021 study by Gregory P. Wilson Mantia and colleagues uh, where new fossils of a genus of plesiodapiform called Purgatorius have been unearthed from northeast Montana. Uh, you may recall that plesiodapiforms are the extinct sister group to the primates, uh, both groups having flourished soon after the end Cretaceous extinction event 66 million years ago. Uh, now, one question that paleontologists are trying to answer is just when these groups evolved in the first place. Mm -hmm. And a big clue to that answer lies with Purgatorius, which has been known since the 1960s based on fragmentary teeth, which is a you know, infamous staple of paleomomology. <laughs> Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Since then, uh, other remains have been found, uh, mostly dental materials, again. Um, but their similarities with later plesiodapiforms have cemented their relationship to that group. And uh, today, in general, Purgatorius is recognized as the earliest diverging member of that clade. Uh, now, these new fossils, and you can see some 3D scans in the leftmost image here, uh, have been found to be the earliest examples of this genus and they date to between 105 and 139,000 years after the kpg boundary that separates the mesozoic from the cenozoic and not only that these fossils actually represent two species um, one that is already known so this is purgatorius janissae which was described in 1994 and then a new one, uh, which was named Purgatorius McKeevery, uh, in honor of the McKeever family, who have supported research in this area of Montana since the 1960s, when the first fossils were found. Uh, now, both species, though, uh, belonging to the same genus, actually have quite distinct features in their dental anatomy, which point to adaptations towards different foods. Now, such an early date for fossils of Pan primates, mm -hmm. uh, which is you know the name that encompasses the true primates and the plesiodapiforms, at basically 66 million years ago, and with more than one species present, um, so soon after the bolide impact, has led the authors to bring forth a long argued possibility that this lineage evolved sometime in the late Cretaceous period. Uh, now, molecular clock estimates have provided data for an early origin. Uh, in episode two, I had mentioned estimates for as much as 85 million years ago, but the lack of clear primate or plesiodapiform fossils from the Mesozoic meant that it could never be fully agreed upon. And uh, many researchers have tended to support a post-extinction origin for those groups. Um, now these new fossils now, you know, different as they are from each other, seem to provide favor towards a pre-extinction origin you know if not long before the extinction you know then at least in the you know few million years before you know this is what is known as a, a soft explosive model mm -hmm. where you know there's an event and species you know just kind of begin to diversify really rapidly but it's not the sort of like adaptive radiation that you sometimes see in the fossil record um, time will tell, of course, you know, if this hypothesis holds out. Um, but, you know, it does at the very least confirm, you know, a fairly recent understanding that, you know, mammals during the time of the extinction event were much more diverse than originally thought. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this image in our heads that Mesozoic mammals, even like in the Cretaceous period, were like just these small shrewy things that hid around in the trees or in burrows and stuff. But, you know, they were already a huge diversity of mammals during the Mesozoic of many different lineages, not just our crown mammals that, you know, we've talked about before. Um, but Albert, I'm curious as to your thoughts on this, because I know <laughs> in regards to crowned birds, mm -hmm. you have argued that 
the presence of such diverse fossils so early in the Cenozoic um, doesn't necessarily mean that we're looking at these groups having emerged so you know early in the Mesozoic. Right. Hmm. Yeah, that that's right. Um, so if you are interested in hearing more about that, uh, you can go back to the first episode of Dinosaurs, the second chapter. But um, yes, uh, there has been a very, very similar kind of debate going on uh, regarding the timing of um, of like when modern type birds appeared, just like um, here with the origin of modern type of placental mammals, um, kind of... Uh, we we see some some con conflicting results um uh when we try to estimate divergence times from like genetic sequences versus um from what we actually observe in the fossil record and so on um and uh yeah um as i as i mentioned in in my series i i think with with birds in general i i would argue that even though crown birds did appear like as a group um in the cretaceous um, I suspect most of the diversification, um, most of the modern lineages uh, originated um, probably shortly after the end Cretaceous mass extinction. And uh, so far, that seems to be most consistent with the fossil record. And um, a lot of the recent um, actual molecular um, estimates um, seem to um, be supporting that as well. But um, yeah, it definitely is still a, a very, a very um, active area of debate. And I know um, pretty much the same debate has been going on with these uh, placental mammals. Um, and uh, I'm definitely um, very curious to see how other researchers respond to this study, because um, I, I do remember seeing um, this study. And um, uh, I do know some researchers have argued that uh, maybe Purgatorius was not even a placental, a true placental mammal at all, but like right. a, a stem placental, like closely related, but um, kind of a, an extinct side branch and not a member of the modern, any of the modern lineages that are still alive today. Um, whereas this study argues that uh, it, it was indeed um, on kind of the primate line, um, so which would make it a true placental. Um, yeah, I, I am curious. Um, uh, I, I think uh, it it definitely will will garner and uh, warrant more study. Um, like uh, personally, I think um, you know, of course, I'm more familiar with the with the bird um, arguments. But um, uh, personally, I, I also tend to think that probably most of placental diversification was after the KPG, although it it might have started before. Um, and I know uh, some of the recent uh, date estimates seem to support that too. Um, in fact, there there was a paper that was, just came out yesterday on like uh, ma mammal um, diversification um, uh, dynamics, basically. And they basically um, started yeah. with a um, genetic tree of living mammals. And uh, what they found was that um, they only found, I think, um, around four um, uh, divergences within like the true placentals that they say... Um, can be confidently um, estimated as having occurred before the KPG, um, which uh, which I can buy. Um, and then they they decide to add some fossils into the analysis and basically uh, put uh, the fossils in the phylogeny where they are thought to be um, thought to belong. And what they found was that um, it turns out that a lot of the Paleocene diversification of mammals probably occurred among these extinct groups um, that didn't leave any descendants. And so uh, that's, uh, they suggest at least, the authors suggest that that's probably the reason why it has been so difficult uh, from the molecular perspective to really identify this explosive radiation of mammals uh, at the KPG, uh, because uh, it turns out maybe only a few lineages of modern mammals originated before, and then most of the diversification happened like sometime after the KPG. But uh, right, right at the KPG, uh, there was perhaps a radiation of like early uh, mammals that didn't uh, make it to the present day in terms of um, not leaving any descendants, um, which is an interesting. Um, interesting idea and i i do think that that's a uh it certainly seems i i, I would say the the idea seems plausible to me uh that that mm -hmm. could be what's going on uh but yeah like as with uh, as with usual with these topics i think uh, i look forward to further studies and it certainly is a very active area of research <laughs>
Yeah, definitely. I mean, like with these, um, I mean, being dated so soon after the KPG, mm -hmm. um, again, we're looking at uh, between 105 and 139,000 years. Um, I guess that would kind of sort of fit into that new study. Um, right. Because again, Pleasy Dapa forms, if we go with the hypothesis that they are not ancestral to primates, but a sister group, right. um, which has been argued because they have features that are, they have, they have lost features in their common ancestry that are used to define modern primates. And so there's like some discrepancies there. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that that's not always the best. Um, it's always the best argument because we're finding more and more examples of these reversals going on in evolution where lineages lose traits only to gain them again. And so it's not necessarily a law that once a, a lineage loses a trait, it can't evolve it again. Right. Unquote. Um, because, as long as like the, the molecular building blocks are still there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, um, that would certainly make a lot of sense. Um, of course, Purgatorius, yeah. I did not mention Purgatorius in Humanity a Prologue mm -hmm. just because of that right. of that discourse. Because yeah, I, I am a little bit familiar with these studies. Like they don't find this to be a pleasy day perform or even like a crown placental. It's, mm -hmm. you know, like, like you said, one of the earlier divergent groups, um, which I suppose would fit more with some of the newer research like you had described right um but if it was you know a please day book form mm -hmm. and thus part of like the the crown placental radiation um well yeah then again the implications there would certainly be yeah big because okay if you have primates and you have please day book forms you know already having diversified right so at that time well then you got to have you know kalugos and then tree shrews and mm -hmm. rodents yep. you know, the glares lineage and then of course you got to have the rage of theories and then on and on and yeah, on right so it's like by arguing that these two lineages are already there you know so late after the so early after the the kpg um well then you kind of have to back that up just from phylogenetic inference to all these other groups that's right yeah where the evidence is even less i mean like right. it's not like the Kalugo fossil record is a gold mine of, of materials <laughs> right. don't really have a lot right um so yeah, it is very curious. Um, uh, and I guess like that, that is another thing I should probably mention too, like as an aside. Um, I've kept these stories at most within last month mm -hmm. being the most recent of these studies. Uh, I think for the purposes of just picking stories and and not getting bogged down by constantly looking at new stuff that comes. Because a, a lot of paleoanth stuff came out this month mm -hmm. that was interesting, but mm -hmm. I felt it was still so new that I didn't want to include it all just sure. yet. Yeah. So that's why I, I, I would have included that um, mammalian study. Oh yeah. <laughs> Cause I think it, it, it would have been relevant enough, but it's just, it was just, it just came and I was already like right. pretty much done working with all of these. So, right. uh, so that, that disclaimer is there. Like the, the most recent stuff on here is from last month. Sure. Um, but uh, who knows? Maybe I'll talk about some of the new paleo ant studies in the next news episode. We got to, we got to brainstorm that stuff. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But uh, yeah, definitely a, uh, a contentious topic, as as you all can see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I definitely would love to see more research done on this. And of course, better purgatorious fossils to begin with. Because I mean, if all we have are jaws and teeth like this, um, then it, it makes it a little bit difficult to really piece together the relationships. Because uh, yeah, again, a lot of early mammals are known from teeth. And uh, right with more complete remains like whole relationships can change you know relatively rapidly um yeah so it's very fascinating stuff um all righty then uh, moving further in time and uh, into the true primate lineage uh, we find our friends the lemurs lorises and galagos the strepsorine primates um of course uh, as a refresher this is one of the two major clades of primates uh, the other being the haplorines which includes the tarsiers the monkeys and the apes now, one aspect of primate evolution that we didn't really cover a whole lot was cognition mm -hmm. and just how well different clades perform on that front. You know, it's been hypothesized that cognition varies among the different primates, but so far the only research that's been done was on haplorines like chimpanzees and macaques, but never so much with lemurs. And so this is what Claudia Fitchell and colleagues did for their September 2020 study. Uh, they looked at three lemur species, uh, the gray mouse lemur, which is shown at the bottom right here, uh, the black and white ruffed lemur, which is shown at the top right here, 
and the ringtail lemur, uh, each with different social structures and ecologies. This is important. And uh, let each of them perform the primate cognition test battery, uh, which consists of various experiments that analyze intelligence in individual and social contexts. Um, to quote the paper, they look at uh, two domains. Uh, the physical domain deals with the spatial temporal causal relations of inanimate objects, while the social domain deals with the intentional actions, perceptions, and knowledge of other animate beings. So using the data they received, they then compared that to previous studies that had been done with haplorines. And it turns out there were both differences and similarities in various fronts. So on the physical domain, lemurs on average did less well than haplorines, but when looking at specifics, there were even matches. Uh, in all cases related to things like spatial memory uh, or object permanence, so you may have seen this with babies, um, monkeys and apes scored higher than lemurs. Um, this result seems to add support for the hypothesis that the increase in brain size during primate evolution uh, allowed for increased learning and memory capabilities. Now, when numerical understanding was examined, uh, nearly all primates scored similarly. Hmm. And this suggests that this trait is ancestral among the group. You know, being a primate means you're good at basic math. <laughs> um, with aspects of causality, so like the relationship between noises, tools, and objects, uh, lemurs received similar scores with monkeys, but both did less well than the apes. Now, however, uh, the tests used for this aspect of cognition were significantly biased against primate species that lack the precision grips needed mm. to grasp used tools by hand. And so they made sure to do alternative tests where th that bias was eliminated. And they revealed similar scores across the board. Um, and a neat finding here was that although lemurs have never been observed using tools in the wild, they seem to at least understand the process behind pulling tools. Mm. Uh, which gives us something to look out for in future field studies. Now, when we look to, at the social domain, uh, the differences in cognition between stepsirines and haplorines generally become smaller. Now, regarding social learning, or whether an animal can perform a task using social clues from a human demonstrator, none of the lemurs, much less the monkeys, could complete the tasks. Uh, while social learning has been observed, in both ring-tailed lemurs and rough lemurs, the authors suggest that there may be a phylogenetic history at play behind the ability of certain primates to solve these puzzles. AKA, it's easier between a uh, between apes than between an ape and a lemur. Hmm. So you know, lemurs work better with each other than you know a, a human working with a lemur. Right, right. In that case. Um, with communication, and here this means specifically, you know, that an animal is able to understand and comprehend visual cues from a human so like you know pointing at a cup with food uh everyone actually did fairly well um and so that means uh, that perhaps this is also an ancestral primate trait and is you know for reference found in many other vertebrate groups too including birds um now when we get to theory of mind so basically looking at others and understanding their intentions this is where the largest differences come into play but not between lemurs and haplorines, as you may expect, but actually between apes and everyone else. Mm. So chimpanzees and orangutans did very poorly in theory of mind experiments, while lemurs and monkeys tended to score equally high results than them. Hmm. Now, to be specific, it means that non-apes have a much easier time understanding intention as the human demonstrator reached their hand into a cup to get food. But apes seem to struggle with this. Huh. You know, instead, they understand gaze following, mm. which is more in line with recent studies that show apes prefer to follow direction by you know, head movements. Mm. Um, the authors are admittedly curious about this, and they conclude, and I quote, a comparative study of theory of mind, compatible learning styles in a simple didactic game between seven primate species, including chimpanzees and ring-tailed lemurs, and a competitive human experimenter revealed that test performance was positively correlated with brain volume, but not with social group size, suggesting that theory of mind is mostly determined by general cognitive capacity. Hmm. 
So in general, what these studies demonstrate is that lemurs don't really have low cognitive abilities compared to other primates, but instead end up on relatively equal playing fields with them in many respects, hmm. you know, including numerical understanding and basic communication. Um, the differences observed seem to have much more to do with both evolutionary history and average social structure, which can produce different results that do not necessarily equal greater or lesser cognitive ability. Um, yeah, Albert, what do you think about that? That sounds like a fascinating study. Um, yeah, I think um, that is uh, those are all really interesting findings, that's for sure. Um, and certainly, um, as some listeners might recall, uh, if you've uh, you know also listened to uh, my series uh, Dinosaurs, the second chapter, uh, in the most recent episode that we did, we actually talked quite a bit about uh, the evolution of like complex cognition, um, not in primates, of course, but in birds. Um, but uh, as we mentioned in that episode, uh, which was episode 14, um, uh, there are a couple of groups of birds that uh, exhibit also very um, complex uh, cognitive abilities, uh, namely the parrots and also the corvids, which are the crows and uh, jays and magpies. Um, and uh, I know a very similar um, kind of a battery test, as they call them, ha have been uh, done uh, quite recently on uh, ravens. Um, and uh, it was found that in many respects, uh, I don't remember exactly which of the tests that they, mm. they used, but um, uh, in many respects, they perform very similarly to things like great apes and, and such. And so obviously uh, that's you know, very impressive, especially considering that uh, their brains in absolute terms are much smaller. Um, so yeah, ravens are really brainy creatures. Um, and yeah, so I, I think... Uh, the fact that we are uncovering that all of these interesting um, abilities that these non-human animals have uh, really, uh, you know, gives us more appreciation for what they're capable of and also tells us a thing or two about the evolution of cognition. And uh, I, I think it is really interesting that uh, we find here that the lemurs uh, do seem to perform comparably to uh, a lot of the haplorines in, in many respects. Because uh, like you said, yeah, they, they are often thought to be, you know, quote unquote, primitive and, you know, less uh, intelligent and such um, compared to things like monkeys and apes. But um, yeah, no, I think obviously there, a lot of their abilities have probably been quite overlooked and uh, it is good to see that more uh, research attention is being focused on that. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think that's important too. Like we expand our research base with these sorts of studies. Mm -hmm. um, Cause this is really the first time that lemurs have been given studies like this. Um, and it's a good start. Um, I'd love to see like, you know, parsier cognition studies. Mm, yes. That's yes. Able to be arranged <laughs> or um, even like just more kinds of primates, like throw an eye eye in there. Or right. Right. <laughs> it's a very divergent member of that group um for sure for sure uh all right let's jump to the next slide now yep. and uh, we'll move forward in time to the ape lineage and uh we come back to a few questions we asked back in episode three you know what was the last common ancestor of chimps and hominins like you know how did it move about was it more like living apes in overall form or was it more human-like or something different um, this particular May 2021 paper by Sergio Almejija and colleagues uh, reviews the current state of evidence to see what is being said. Uh, in episode three, we clarified a few things about our state of knowledge. One, there are many uncertainties about the phylogeny of apes when fossils are included. Um, and you know, we have groups like dryopithecines, which are likely paraphyletic, um, and we have next to nothing as far as fossils are concerned, for stem gorillas or stem chimps. Mm -hmm. So clarifying our last common ancestor this way it has been difficult. Uh, then two, information about geographic location or dating in the geologic record is equally difficult for the same reasons given previously. But an African origin is at least the most likely. Uh, so then three, environmental data for the earliest hominins at least suggests that the common ancestor lived in an open woodland environment. And then four, anatomy-wise, uh, it's been hypothesized that the common ancestor may have used an extended limb clambering 
to move in the trees, you know, kind of taking a branch at a time, uh, and that it was capable of perhaps very limited terrestrial bipedality uh, while deferring to quadrupedalism most of the time. So uh, what does this review article have to say now that it's incorporating more recent information? Well, right away, the, author, the authors state that this is still a difficult question to answer. Mm -hmm. um, trying to piece out the possible traits for the last common ancestor through analysis of living apes will lead to skewed results. Because gibbons, orangutans, gorillas, chimps, and humans represent just a handful of survivors out of a much larger and more diverse assemblage, which is itself very poorly known in many respects. Mm -hmm. So it seems best to consider phenotypic and behavioral possibilities outside of those seen in living apes, mm. while keeping the spectrum of fossil ape characteristics in mind, you know, when we're thinking about the nature of our common ancestor. So yeah, so far, nothing really new here. Um, in terms of dating, the authors favor a window of time between 9.3 and six and a half million years ago for the time of our common ancestor, which is based on like recent dating techniques. Um, but questions about geographic location still remain unclear. Um, so, for example, regarding the unclear monophyletic status of the mostly European dryopithecines, and if you look to the graphic to the left, they're shaded in yellow, uh, it may be that the last common ancestor of the African apes, so that's gorillas as well as chimps and hominins, may actually have evolved in Europe among that assemblage before retreating into Africa during late Miocene times, which lines up with the cooling climate at the time that had basically ended the period of tropical forests there in Europe, and thus the time of the Dryopithecines. Um, but they do give another equally likely possibility, um, of course, which would mean that the, the Dryopithecines actually have nothing to do with African apes at all, and that the relatives paleoanthropologists have been looking for just haven't been found on the African continent. Um, I mean, that's not so far-fetched, really. Um, and, you know, as archaeology is expanding into places like Western and Central Africa, you know, perhaps it won't be long before paleoanthropology reaches those places, too. Uh, now, environmentally, the authors say, you know, our last common ancestor with chimps seems to have lived in a wooded ecosystem at least. But there is no preference given to open or closed woodland. Uh, that leaves us just with you know the anatomical question. You know, how would the common ancestor have moved about then? Well, given the totality of similarities between the earliest known hominins and the fossils we have of early apes, the authors actually state that an orthograde or upright posture may have been likely for our common ancestor. Hmm including an ability for vertical climbing in trees. But, and I quote here, not necessarily adapted specifically for below branch suspension or knuckle walking. Mm. Now, of course, chimpanzees and bonobos, by contrast, are less similar to early hominins when considering aspects of limb anatomy. So this review you know, further reiterates the need to not use those species as models. And instead, the authors urge researchers to consider that the pan lineage might have undergone the sorts of radical transformations that our human ancestors went through. And now this implies then that the sort of obligate bipedalism seen in hominins was acquired over time through co-opting of these upright vertical climbing adaptations as the climate changed and the forests began to give way to more open environments. Uh, in the end, however, we still have many gaps to fill in our understanding of ape fossil of the ape fossil record before we can say for sure what our common ancestor with chimps may have been like hmm. um, but at least we're in a, a position now to say where we should look for clues specifically and you know what we should be more cautious about right so let's jump to the next slide now and uh, we have something a little bit different for a change hmm. uh, honest to goodness hominin phylogeny <laughs> whoa imagine that um, yeah so we can thank Miguel Caparos and Sandre Pratt for this one from their April 2021 paper. Uh, this research stemmed from a desire to understand human evolution with a more modern perspective, uh, which you know ditches the famous dichotomies like anagenesis versus cladogenesis, um, which is like 
direct descendants from a lineage versus just splitting of branches to and fro, uh, or things like the out of Africa versus multi-regionalism hypothesis, you know, in favor of a more nuanced approach that considers all the data we've been receiving about hybridization and phenotypic diversity. Um, the authors call this reticulate evolution. So their data set looks at craniodental features, so skulls and teeth, uh, which is you know, really the best source of information at the moment, given that we don't exactly have fairly complete skeletons for many of these name hominins. Um, and this data stems mostly from previous work by uh, Mana Dembo and colleagues, which I've used to help reconstruct the hominin phylogenies that I've shown throughout this series. Mm -hmm. uh, as they've, they're really some of the best and most complete attempts so far, you know, prior to this. Um, and they encompass something like 391 different characters. One important aspect of this work that the author's research indicates um, is that maximum parsimony is a more accurate means of uncovering relationships through phylogeny than the Bayesian method. Hmm. Um, so, uh, okay. The differences between the two require a lot of backstory um, and a lot of like info on like calculus and statistics. So <laughs> for now, all you need to know is that the Bayesian method tends to rely on prior knowledge about the data, while maximum parsimony is more about mean and variance in the data. You know, it tells you what's most likely to be accurate. Um, you know, using the latter removes issues relating to possible biases. I mean, the authors state flatly that they took the data at face value rather than assume, you know, species would group together. Um, uh, I, I think I explained that pretty well. What do you think? Yeah, the, the basic uh, idea is there. Um, I, I will say, uh, you know, be, being someone who is involved in phylogenetics research, the yeah. the whole um, the whole parsimony versus Bayesian debate is a is a raging kind of kind of thing. Um, like, well, which which methods are are the best to use in reconstructing phylogeny? So, um, I, I definitely uh, would not consider this to be the last word on that by any means. Um, now I haven't I haven't actually read this study myself, so I, I'm not exactly sure what their arguments are. But um, yeah, personally, I I do um, I have used both parsimony and Bayesian in my own um, research, um, and they usually tend to get pretty similar results anyway, um, especially working with them um, anatomical data. So yeah, I mean, I can. I can see certain arguments uh, for or against either one, um, but um, I tend to think that in the end, uh, what matters most is how um, how good and accurate the data you're inputting is. And uh, yeah, so um, that that's kind of my brief take on that. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. That's totally fair. Um, I mainly don't know too much about this discourse myself. Um, I was actually surprised to kind of read about it when looking through this paper, um, but. Uh, I guess it's just, it's just to clarify, the authors uh, say that all of the, the Dembo et al. phylogenies that have been produced recently, um, uh, he, he's a paleoanthropologist who's done a lot of work on this front, um, they have all used the Bayesian methods. Mm, right. Um, and I guess this is the first time they've taken that data and put it through a, a parsimony mm -hmm. analysis instead. Um, and yeah, I mean, when you put it like that, um, it is interesting to compare those previous studies with this one. Because really, it's it's the exact same data set. Mm -hmm. They just switched the methods. That's basically what this paper did. Um, so it's curious to compare those previous results with what we have here. And yeah, you know, in looking at the phylogeny produced, what they found in general matches what has been known in recent years, um, with a few tweaks here and there. Um, you know, in that the branching pattern roughly follows the same grades that this series has used. You know, they're Australopithecines and habilines and erectines and so forth. Um, so kind of, to kind of break this tree down a bit, um, Sahelanthropus and Artipithecus form a polytomy at the base of the hominin tree. Uh, this makes sense. Uh, we don't have a whole lot on Sahelanthropus, and we have mm. quite a bit on, on Artipithecus romidus. So uh, things are getting better. But I can imagine it's difficult to tell which of these species or which of these lineages may have been more similar to the common ancestor than the other. And of course, again, that goes back to the previous discussion. Um, so then there, it's followed by various Australopithecines that branch here and there that again generally matches what we see. You know, Anamensis is one of the earliest ones to branch off, and then Afrensis forms a group with Garhi. 
Um, and then it's followed by Africanus, who is more closely related to Homo and so forth. Um, and then, of course, there's a branching event between Paranthropus and everybody else. And now right away, this further argues for the need to stop using Australopithecus, you know, as a, as in this way, as a paraphyletic mm. group. Um, you know, that we should really be giving distinct names to these different lineages because they're all not so closely related to each other to mm. warrant that sort of treatment. Um, now, as we move further up the tree, uh, we get into the territory of the genus Homo. And sure enough, we find that Australopithecus sediba mm. groups within Homo. So it would be Homo sediba. Um, but curiously, and this is where things start to de deviate, it forms a sister group with Homo naledi. Hmm. Now, this is a far cry from previous studies, which found that this species evolved within the erectine radiation much earlier well, much later in time than it's implying here. Um, but it does make more sense in this case, as a lot of the morphology of Homo naledi, uh, you know, is closer to that of Habilines. Uh, speaking of Habilines, um, they show up next on the tree in the form of Homo habilis and Homo thuresiensis. But these seem to form a polytomy with more derived Homo. Now, uh, again, this sort of matches what we've talked about. You know, Homo thuresiensis seems to be a very early diverging lineage in human evolution, uh, rather than the sort of island dwarf that stemmed from Homo erectus, as was a very early idea. Um, and next up, we have another polytomy. But here, things get really interesting again. Uh, Homo rudolfensis makes up one branch, while another forms uh, ever more derived Homo, so things like Homo sapiens and the Neanderthals, which is in line like, like really closely with the genetic and protein data. So not much comment on that front. Um, but then we have a branch with Georgicus, Eargaster, and Erectus, which effectively makes a case for the lumpers who consider all of these forms to be variants of Homo erectus, mm. which is admittedly unexpected in my book. Um, this result hasn't really been received in a lot of the earlier phylogenies before. Mm. Um but this is kind of what we have so far. So I'm very curious to see if other newer studies pick up on this, um, especially when you consider like the branching pattern. So in terms of features, uh, Eargaster and Georgicus here are shown to be more closely related to each other than Erectus, which has very derived features for the erectine grade, hmm. um, which, is, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, because they didn't explain that result too, too much in the paper. Um, they just kind of make it a point like, okay, we can we could effectively call all these Homo erectus if we wanted to. Um, so I guess we'll see about that. Right. Um, but yeah, so then when we look at the reticulate phylogeny on the right, this general pattern is retained. But again, you know, it more closely follows what paleoanthropologists have been arguing recently regarding you know, widespread interbreeding that at least within Homo, and perhaps all the way back to the Australopithecine grade, you know, all of these different hominins were interbreeding with each other. And uh, in fact, oh, I want to say it was that mammal radiation study. If it was not that one that you did, that you had talked about, Albert, hmm. it may have been a similar recent one where the authors state outright that the level of interbreeding between hominins may have been so great that we should probably reconsider how we view the branching patterns mm -hmm. within this group. Um, you know, really just a big smorgasbord of interbreeding between right, all of right. our ancestors, um, which probably explains why it's been so difficult to find consistent results with previous attempts using just morphology. Um, well, I, I mean, using morphology in, in a morphometrics sort of way. Like you're comparing like the measurements of the skulls rather than plugging them all into an analysis, right? Mm -hmm. um, as is typical for paleoanthropologists. Right. Um, but yeah, so whether or not these results hold up, and I mean, the way this field works, I find it very hard to believe that this is the last word on the subject. Um, you know, it's an important step in the right direction. You know, as if I need to say it again, paleoanthropologists need to retire this consistent approach to studying remains where they just, you know, do basic comparisons between skulls 
you know, they, they, they have to record all of those characters they're using and then plug them in a data set with many samples to compare and run a phylogeny. You know, it, it will save a lot of headache and discourse and go a long way towards, you know, updating the field as well as understanding just what this diversity of fossils really means. Um, I mean, I, I think that's a fair plea, don't you think, Albert? Yeah, indeed. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, but okay, yeah, let's let's go to the next slide now, um, and to uh, episode four. And uh, we have two papers here on Australopithecines that give additional information about the evolution of obligate bipedalism and how different extinct hominins use their limbs. And uh, this is some really cool stuff, honestly. Hmm. Um, some of my favorite studies that I'm going to cover today. Uh, the first, and which is illustrated here by these two charts, is a May 2021 study by uh, Anjali M. Prumhat and colleagues. It's well known at this point that the earliest hominins were most likely arboreal in some respects, and that obligate bipedalism was a later development, even if many Pliocene hominins retained tree climbing abilities at the same time. You know, they were very flexible in how they moved around. Um, a big question has been just how long it took for arboreal adaptations, particularly in the limb joints, to peter out while terrestrial bipedal locomotion became the norm. And, and, you know, and which species illustrate this change the best? Um, one curious observation has been that Praeanthropus afarensis, so that's Lucy and Salam species, uh, sports larger leg joints than arm joints which is much more similar to the arrangement seen in Homo sapiens than in other early hominins like Australopithecus africanus and Homo habilis, uh, which are more closely related to us than afarensis, which is not what you'd think, right? You know, you'd think that, okay, probably we evolved from something closely related to afarensis because those features are more similar, but mm -hmm. that's not the case that we've been seeing. Um, so we have two possibilities then. Both afarensis and sapiens independently evolved these limb joint proportions or this arrangement evolved in the common ancestor of those two species and was subsequently lost in other hominins. Now, both of these hypotheses are really fascinating. And so the authors test these models by taking measurements of the limbs and joints of many hominins, as well as living apes, to really see how the limbs and joints of our ancestors evolved over time. So they're also using a phylogenetic method in this study while not, not necessarily producing their own independent phylogeny, hmm. um, which is kind of interesting. Um, so the chart at the left is a relative limb size index. So it compares the fossil specimens to the range seen in living apes. And the chart on the right is another such index. This time it only analyzes uh, three features, uh, the diameter of the femoral head so this is the round joint that connects the femur to the pelvis. Um, then they look at the width of the sacrum. So that's the base of the pelvis where the vestigial tailbone or coccyx lies. Um, and then three, uh, they look at the width of the humeral biepicondylar, which is uh, located in the elbow. Um, those three bones are really important in locomotory studies. And what this analysis has found was that arboreal adaptations akin to what we see in living apes at least were still prevalent in Australopithecus africanus, uh, two species in the genus Paranthropus, as well as Homo sediba, habilis, and floresiensis. Hmm. It was confirmed that Praeanthropus afarensis sported more Homo sapiens-like adaptations towards terrestrial bipedalism, which was also shared with Homo ergaster. And this is more in line with the hypothesis that afarensis acquired those joint proportions independently of Homo sapiens. Which means that for much of early hominin history, even into the genus Homo, you know, the features of the skeleton could still support arboreal locomotory behaviors. Huh. Um, and that's not to say that these hominins were not as bipedally efficient as we once thought. I mean, the evidence we have says otherwise. But rather that it just it took a long time for us to come out of the trees for good. Right. Hmm. Um, Preanthropus afarensis then represents an interesting derivation among early hominins. You know, it still would have been able to climb trees. We're fairly confident about that. But it had adapted itself to handle the stresses of obligate bipedalism in a way that later members of the hominin lineage wouldn't solve until the erectine grade. 
Um, which is interesting. Independent evolution, like independent convergent evolution within hominids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not something you really read about all that much. Yeah, that um, is really interesting. That that's such a such a cool finding. <laughs> yeah. Um it, again it kind of just goes to show like that that stereotypical gradation model that we see in popular right. culture like the, the the four walking ape turning into a human it's like no it's very complex things are happening in, in, right. in and um, very diverse things um yeah so the second paper is an april 2021 study by a christian j carlson and colleagues and it concerns the exciting and newly prepared littlefoot specimen uh, in this series i attribute it to australopithecus africanus but if you read some of the journal articles um some authors have argued that this is a new species and they call it Australopithecus prometheus. Mm -hmm. Still related to Africanus, but distinct enough. Uh, that, that's, that's a whole thing, though. Uh, instead of taxonomy, though, uh, the authors here are concerned with little foot's shoulders and specifically the pectoral girdle, which have been finally excavated from the rock matrix for proper study for the first time. Um, in light of the previous study that I just talked about, there's not too much new to add other than the fact that the shoulder analysis supports the hypothesis that early hominins still retained many adaptations for tree living. Uh, the arrangement of Littlefoot's pectoral girdle suggests that it was, you know, very weight supporting, uh, almost gorilla-like in mm. form, uh, which points to a role in vertical climbing and suspension in trees more than how arms are used in humans today. Mm. Um, yeah, it's always interesting to see, you know, different papers come to similar conclusions. Um, and I mean, studies like these are very important in answering big questions about human origins. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, okay, let's jump to the next slide now. Um, and we'll continue forwards in time again, mm -hmm. uh, where we reach the Old Divide Gorge in Tanzania around 2 million years ago. And this is concerning a January 2021 study by Julio Mercator and colleagues. Or should I say Old Dupai Gorge? So this is kind of a neat thing that I found. Hmm. It turns out that Old Dubai is a mispronunciation. Oh. That's way back in the early 1900s by an archaeologist named Hans Reck. And it just stuck around for decades following the work of the Leakey family. Huh. Hmm. The word is actually Old Dupai, huh. um, which comes from the local Maasai language. Hmm. Um, so yeah, whenever we're talking about human origins, you know, I, I'm going to do my best to help spread the word, but we should all be saying old Dupai instead of old Dubai. So there's a, there's a, there's an update for you. <laughs> uh, interesting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anywho, uh, this study concerns the environmental changes taking place in East Africa within a period of over 200,000 years, you know, going back, um, 2 million years or so, um, in this series, we had discussed how, in general, there was a belt of open woodland in Savannah, what is known as Savannistan, that had stretched across Africa and southern Eurasia, which provided suitable habitat for hominins, particularly in the genus Homo, you know, which may have already entered Eurasia at around 2 million years ago, much earlier than was previously thought. Um, now, previous research has been able to paint this picture of Savannistan based mostly on a few sites like Old Dupai, where the remains of animals as well as isotopic samples have been used to deduce what the plant life in the region was like, um, even if we lack good plant fossils for those sites. Um, but if you're lucky, you can find preserved pollen, or you can find phytoliths, which are these tiny minerals that are found inside grasses and leaves. And these are so distinct in form that they can be used to identify plants fairly accurately, at least to the genus uh, uh, level um and this is just what this research has done uh they compare those results uh with some recovered old one tools and remains that have been found alongside them like we see here the image on the right and uh, these results indicate that when looking at the specific environment over this slice of time around two million years ago hominins were not inhabiting a relatively static comfortable ecosystem as is generally argued um, by the Savannah Stan model, but rather they were living in one that underwent significant changes fairly quickly. So just over 200,000 years, this part of the gorge went from a fern meadow 
to a mosaic shrubland, to a wooded palm forest, to a savanna, to an open woodland, and then back to a shrubland. And throughout all of that, not only did the hominins manage to adjust and survive, I mean, they would often stick close to any lakes that were around, but they did so without any changes to their old Awan toolkit. Now, this sort of behavioral flexibility is fascinating to see so early in hominin history, um, when this sort of behavior is usually associated with later species, especially Homo sapiens. Um, you know, this research seems to provide some very good context for the sorts of traits that allowed hominins to expand around the world during the early Pleistocene. And it, it really continues to demonstrate that many of the features anthropologists thought were unique to sapiens were actually found among our relatives much further back in time. Um, and it really kind of throws a little bit of a wrench into the Savannah stand model, because with that, it's implied that, oh, the conditions were relatively good across this belt of ecosystem, therefore it made it easier for hominins to go from place to place. And yet we're seeing that th these individuals can live through such rapid changes to their environment with very little need to adjust. Hmm. Um, like their old tools work just as well in the fern meadow as, as in the woodland or the savanna. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's some really incredible stuff, honestly. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Um, let's jump to the next slide. Uh, and uh, we're going to continue our episode here. Um, now, speaking of the role of environment in human evolution, uh, this next paper from July 2021, so just this month, um, comes to us from Manuel Will and colleagues. Now, in episode five, we only briefly talked about hominin brains and how, in general, there is a growth in cranial capacity across the family tree, going from a chimpanzee-sized capacity among Australopithecines to a spike in growth between 600 and 800 cc's with the evolution of the genus Homo and beyond. Although species like Floresiensis and the Lidi show a, a greater diversity in cranial capacity than is usually appreciated. Um, now, we mentioned at least that social behavioral factors may have contributed to this increase, you know, as the first humans were living in larger groups and engaging more with collective learning. Uh, but we also know from research like that of J. Bay Smears and colleagues, which we actually talked about in our April 2021 news episode, that brain size can also increase simply because the body increases in size, as in an allometric slope. Um, in particular, the authors of this paper are interested in another possible factor that led to this rise in cranial capacity, you know, that being the role of geography in determining brain and body size. Mm -hmm. um, so in biology, there are a number of different rules that have been proposed to explain observations about animal body size and environment. Mm -hmm. uh, like there's Allen's rule after Joel Asaf Allen from an 1877 paper, which states that warm blooded animals living in cold regions will adapt themselves by sporting shorter limbs and ears, which helps reduce heat loss by reducing surface area. Um, then there's things like Bergman's rule after Carl Bergman from an 1847 paper which follows a similar idea, uh, but it's where warm-blooded animals living in cold regions adapt to larger body sizes, while those in warm regions adapt to smaller body sizes. So like there's usually a gradient between the larger relatives in the north, and then as you get further south, the body sizes get smaller and smaller as the climate warms towards the equator. Um, these rules are well known in biological anthropology. Um, if you read any like paleoanthropology textbook, uh, the most common examples you'll see are like Arctic peoples, like the Inuit, are generally stockier and they have shorter limbs than tropical peoples, like the Maasai of East Africa, who are typically thin and have long limbs. Um, yeah, uh, I don't want to get too, too deep into it. And Albert, you are more than welcome to throw in your two cents. Mm. Um, but I'm, I'm aware that biologists in recent years have come to question the authority of these rules because there's a lot of research that indicates that while they hold true for individual species across the board, they don't accurately explain observations. Mm -hmm. um, does that sound about right? I would say so. Yeah. Yeah. There is some, I think um, like 
as a general trend, um, they they still um, hold. I, I think most most biologists would accept that. But uh, yeah, I, there's definitely some question about how strictly um, they actually hold. Yeah. Mm. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, even so, you know, an animal's environment does play a crucial role in its evolution, mm -hmm. and that's taken as a given. Yep. Um, mm. So the you know, researchers, like the authors of this study, you know, are they're curious to see if rules like these do have some legitimacy when it comes to understanding the geographic distribution of hominins and the evolution of body and brain. So uh, looking across one million years of hominin history in Africa, Eurasia, and Sahul, the authors took skull and body measurements from over 300 homo specimens, you know, alongside data of the past environment in which each individual fossil was located, and they then compared them all with long-term climate data. And what they showed was that although there was a correlation between body size and climate, and in particular, they offer Bergman's rule, some pardon, mm -hmm. um, brain size was not correlated in this way. Mm -hmm. Instead, it seems that the size of the brain had more to do with ecology. Larger brain humans typically inhabited open environments like grasslands, uh, that were less vulnerable to dramatic landscape changes than forests. Um, and this tells us that variability in brain size among human species may be linked to the types of resources available in a given region, how long they're available for, and how cultural practices aided subsistence practices, ultimately meaning that the challenges faced in open habitats may have created stressors that eventually gave rise to larger brain descendants, mm. like, say, new hunting behaviors. Um, and this can be generally seen in species like early homo that are living more and more in open environments. And then it's with species like the Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, who were you know, eventually able to live and thrive in radically different ecosystems, thanks in part to this early socially and environmentally crafted evolution of their supersized brains which is interesting to think about. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I think uh, these two papers between these last two slides offer some interesting perspectives on human evolution over the, you know, a period of 2 million years at least. Uh, what do you think, Albert? Yeah, uh, they definitely do. I would agree. <laughs> all right, yeah. Um, all right, then let's jump to the next slide. Um, and this is a September 2020 paper oh, yeah. mm -hmm. by... Dylan Gaffney, uh, which is simultaneously a review article. Um, you know, it, it looks at the role of marine dispersal among hominins throughout their history, but it also functions as a test for the adaptive flexibility hypothesis, which is displayed in the graphic to the left. Now, uh, this states, and I quote, that the number of behavioral variants will be high during the introduction stage of colonization due to adaptive innovations and then will gradually decline as successful behaviors are shared within the group during the establishment period of population growth. So in other words, you know, a bunch of folks will try different approaches to solving a problem, in this case, settling in new land. But you know, once the best idea is tried and it succeeds, more people will steer towards those options as the other ideas are abandoned. Mm. Gaffney is curious whether different human species from Erectus to Floresiensis to Sapiens all attained the same sort of adaptive flexibility when it came to crossing seas and oceans, or whether it varied only to accumulate with our species, which, as we've seen, managed to successfully construct watercraft with the capability to reach the far Pacific islands. Mm -hmm. So basically, like, is the adaptive flexibility hypothesis a gradient in human origins? Well, based on the data available, Gaffney reaches three conclusions. Uh, first of all, all of the earlier Pleistocene marine dispersals by non-homo sapiens species seem to have all been small-scale affairs or distances of up to 30 kilometers. While they all seem to have been intentional expansions, uh, they were nothing too ambitious, rather you know, focusing on known familiar regions instead of like just these vast unknown expanses. Um, while direct evidence is lacking, it's possible that there was a fair range of experimentation going on, you know, from direct swimming 
to the construction and testing of watercraft technologies like rafts and hollowed logs. Um, and then two, Homo sapiens represents the extreme end of this spectrum, you know, having gone farther than the other species across larger stretches of ocean. And not only that, their presence on certain islands with low biodiversity suggests a great flexibility and adaptation towards new resources, including the importation of outside foods to create sustainable stocks. This is something that we only see with Homo sapiens, not with other hominins. And then three, it turns out it's actually unclear at the moment just how this shift in adaptive flexibility occurred in the first place. How long did it take for the ancestors of Homo sapiens to reach the end of the spectrum? You know, did it take them thousands of years to go through possible strategies before settling on the best ones? Um, or was this process fairly quick? Um, with that, we don't know. Mm. Um, and better remains are needed to help fill in some of the gaps in the archaeological record that could help us answer these questions. Um, but for now, just to conclude, uh, this paper suggests that, you know, just based on the evidence, Adaptive flexibility in regards to the problems of maritime travel seems present across human species, hmm. but is larger and more pronounced in Homo sapiens, which I think, given the observations, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, all right, let's jump to the next slide. And now we're on episode six, hmm. our erecting episode. Um, and this slide covers three papers that all center around stone toolkits, which is always fun. Um, out of all of these, however, the first one here uh, from March 2020, which admittedly does predate humanity a prologue like in its entirety, um, but it was not brought to my attention until recently. Hmm. So here we are. I'm, yeah. I'm breaking my rule here. Um, this is by a Celeshi Shaman colleagues, and it really provides an important lesson in scholarship. There is a convention in paleoanthropology to assign specific toolkits to hominin species. Mm. Even if at times, those correlations aren't always concrete. Uh, in this case, the old Dewan toolkit is often attributed mostly to Homo habilis and its kin, mm -hmm. while the Ashulean toolkit is assigned to Homo erectus and its kin. Um, a few finds from the Afar region of Ethiopia, dated to between 1.6 and 1.26 million years ago, however, demonstrate that Homo ergaster was utilizing both the Old Duan and the Australian toolkit at the same time. Hmm. It seems that for these humans, both toolkits offered different solutions to different needs, and the makers could readily switch between modes of construction depending on the situation, resulting in this case in the tools seen at the image to the far left. Um, so we have Australian tools on the top in the A box and the Old Duan tools in the B box. Now, this behavioral flexibility, again, among early humans is not all that surprising, uh, you know, given what we've just seen throughout the series. But it really does provide a warning to anthropologists who kind of want to continue to use the single toolkit, single species method of research. Mm -hmm. There are currently many toolkits found across the archaeological record that have been broadly assigned to hominin grades, that, for example, like middle Pleistocene humans, mm -hmm. um, but were rarely able to put specifics together. And this paper represents a successful attempt to do so. You know, we actually have a toolkit that we know is used by a species. Mm. Um, and we can only hope to perform more studies like this to help flush out the story of hominin toolmaking. Now, the next paper is a May 2021 study by Eleanor Sherry and colleagues, uh, providing the earliest known evidence of Australian tools in Arabia, specifically the Nifud Desert in the north, which is shown here on the map to the right with the really beautiful hand axes to the immediate left of that map. Mm. Um, these tools are about 330,000 years old and are within the context of a lush green Arabia phase in Pleistocene history. Now, typically, Australian tools found near water are, are, are found near water sources, um, and sites with these tools are known as far back as 1.7 million years ago. Uh, so this has led the authors to suggest that the humans who used these sorts of tools only entered the Arabian Peninsula during the wet periods when it was fertile enough to support them. This is more or less in line with other research with species like Homo sapiens that are known from later green Arabia periods. Um, and it's possible that 
those times were the most crucial for transcontinental movement between Africa and Eurasia, especially in later years of the Pleistocene. Uh, lastly, we have a March 2021 study by Alistair Key and colleagues, which takes us to the tail end of the Ashulain's existence on Earth. Um, in episode 6, I stated that the end date for the Ashulain toolkit was a rather hazy affair. You know, it kind of petered out by 250,000 years ago. Um, but really, paleoanthropologists you know, are unclear just how this technology phased out and just when did it stop being used altogether. You know, nobody today makes Australian toolkits, so there had to have been some point where people just made that transition to something new. Um, well, now, thanks to this study, we can get closer to answering this question hmm. while also bringing out some new details. Now, using a method called optimal linear estimation, uh, which is used by paleontologists to estimate the extinction times for a species, um, but has yet to be fully implemented in archaeology is re regarding cultural materials. Um, the authors analyzed the global record of Ashulayan tools uh, to see when this toolkit was fading out of use and how long it could have potentially stayed around. Um, their estimates provide some really late dates for the end of the Ashulayan toolkit, um, which gives archaeologists something to look out for in future digs. Um, so for, for specifics, in Africa and Southwest Asia, this tradition is estimated to have ended between 175 and 166,000 years ago, so well within the time of early Homo sapiens on that continent. Um, in Europe, between 141 and 130,000 years ago, so well within the time of the Neanderthals. And then in East Asia, as late as 57 to 53,000 years ago, which is attributed to geographic isolation for those parts of the world. Um, which is really, really late. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, sapiens by now had spread into East Asia by that time, um, at, at least. So I think given our current understanding of hominin tool use and the distribution of species through time, that would mean that the practice of using Ashulayan tools was still helpful for some folks, mm -hmm. um, even as new technologies were beginning to spread around those times. So the Australian tools would have been the CDs in a world of online streaming. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, what, what do you think, Albert? Yeah, that, that is a really interesting find. And, um, you know, I think it's uh, definitely a good um, good point to keep in mind that, yeah, uh, the toolkits are not necessarily tied to, like, individual species or, or even sets of species, um, like, yeah, certainly um, it's not hard to imagine that the same species could be using several different types of toolkits for um, for different purposes as needed. And yeah, I think all of these studies are uh, really interesting and add a lot of nuance to that picture. Definitely. Um, I, I know we talked about in episode seven that, again, like like the, this, this haziness of the Australian toolkit mm -hmm. has been well known for a while now because we see evidence of like, yeah, again, like Homo ergaster, Homo erectus using it, and then like later species like Antecessor. So yeah, it, it definitely does add further to that picture that yeah, we just, just let's just be careful when talking about toolkits. And and you know, it's not like today we, we say that oh only these people use hammers, only these people right. use scissors. It's like no, it, it's the stuff is shared quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Um and it, it it just seems to make sense that as toolkits transition older ones will hang around for a lot longer before they're eventually just abandoned. Um, again, like people still use CDs today. I, yeah. I still like using CDs, um, mm -hmm. even though like that's technically an obsolete technology mm -hmm. because everybody streams things nowadays. Right. Um, <laughs> that's just how it is. Um, all right, let's go to the next slide. And uh, now we're going to spend a tiny bit of time with the Neanderthals, everyone's mm. favorite. Episode. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're over 6,000 views on that one now. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, many thanks to everybody for tuning in. Um, so yeah, so uh, this is another paper from this month uh, by Dirk Leader and colleagues. And uh, I, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess I'm kind of breaking my rule a little bit about the episodes are only coming at most from June. Uh, I, I snuck in a few July studies in here. You know, sue me. Um, <laughs> so uh, this, this paper is by Dirk Leader and colleagues, um, and it shows us some new evidence for Neanderthal aesthetics. Now, this is uncovered from the entrance of the Unicorn Cave in northern Germany. And uh, it was this finger bone of a now extinct deer called Megaloceros giganteus. Mm. Uh, this is probably known as the Irish elk, although it 
wasn't related to elk, nor was it limited just to Ireland. Hmm. Um, uh, this is a species related to the European fallow deer and was actually found way across Eurasia um, for a good period of time. Um, so on the phalanx, which is shown here at the left, uh, you can see some non-randomly placed engravings that have been described as inverted Vs. And this bone has been dated to 51,000 years ago and is present in an area of the world known for Neanderthal technology and activity during this time supports the link between the two. Now, the style of the engravings and the fact that, you know, this was an animal that we know was hunted by Neanderthals, it matches with previous findings. And so this just further adds confirmation that, you know, these close relatives of ours were just as capable of creating symbolic energy as we are. Now, our second Neanderthal story uh, actually comes from a May 2021 Guardian article that was written by Lorenzo Tondo that announced some new excavation work. So, yeah, there's no formal paper out yet, but I felt that this was at least a neat thing to include. Hmm. Um, basically, uh, archaeologists working in the uh, Guattari Cave in Italy uncovered nine individual Neanderthals consisting of seven adult males, one adult female, and a young boy. Uh, but they all date to different times. Uh, some of the uh, oldest ones are being found to be around... 100,000 years old, while others seem to be as young as 50,000 years old. Um, and the fact that the bones here, many of them are actually broken. Mm. And the way that they're broken is really reminiscent of certain animals that scavenge. Mm -hmm. And so the researchers hypothesized that cave hyenas were responsible for these remains. Uh, they hunted these Neanderthals and just dragged them back to their cave to feast on. Um, and the fact that the cave has since collapsed and is only now being resurfaced means that we're now able to find these remains at all. Um, that seems to be the hypothesis the authors are going with at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but there are also some uncertainties about these remains, given the, you know, the length of time. You know, did the cave belong to the hyenas exclusively throughout this period, or was there a period where Neanderthals were living in there and were maybe driven out by the hyenas or, or something along those lines? It, it's hard to say. Um, and this research is still ongoing. And so I'm, I'm, I definitely look forward to when the paper officially gets published mm. so we can get to the bottom of these sorts of things. Um, but okay, now we come to one of the major stories of this updates episode. I'm mm. sure we're all been waiting for this one. <laughs> uh, if we go to the next slide. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Homo longi. Uh, the dragon human. Yep. Um, yeah, this has been in the news quite a bit in recent months. And uh, I mean, the excitement and the discourse and confusion has been yeah, him. Right. Um, I mean, my goodness, uh, some close friends of mine, when they heard about all this stuff going on, they're like, what the heck is going on with paleoanthropologists? <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and you know what? I don't blame them, honestly. Um, so this research has been stretched out into three simultaneous papers back in June, uh, which are all open access, so you can check them out. Of course, we'll, we'll put all the links in our description, of course. Um, and they describe the skull of a human who lived over 146,000 years ago that was unearthed in Harbin City, China, which is seen in the map to the left. Uh, as far back as 1933, during the construction of a bridge that covered the site. Now, at the time, this part of China was part of, of the Manchurian state. So under the thumb of the Japanese empire. Uh, and there was, you know, a big rush of excitement at the time about human origins because the Peking man was only found just a few years earlier. Mm. Um, and so the construction worker who found this skull and who remains anonymous as per his family's wishes, um, he was concerned about the Japanese authorities, you know, taking a hold of the skull. And so he actually hid it away in an old water well which I guess is like a, a, a really like traditional Chinese method of hiding stuff mm -hmm. from people. Um, and it just sat there for 85 years until, you know, the very same construction worker was on the verge of death. And he told his family about this secret skull. Um, so the family got the skull, uh, by which point, you know, a paleoanthropologist, uh, Ji Shang or Ji Chang, uh, had managed to convince the family to donate it to the Heibei University of Geosciences, where you know it could be finally scientifically studied. And so 
technically, if you want to think about it, Homo longi is a rediscovery. Mm -hmm. Now, the skull itself is really wonderfully preserved. You know, it's only missing most of the teeth, so it's virtually complete. Um, it's pretty hefty in size. Uh, it measures 221.3 millimeters long by 164.1 millimeters wide. Um, it has a cranial capacity of 1420. So it's comparable to that of both Neanderthals and Homo sapiens mm -hmm. within that range. Um, there's a thick brow ridge, and the cranium itself is low with an occipital bun, uh, which matches many middle Pleistocene humans like Neanderthals. The face itself, however, is flattened like that of sapiens, mm -hmm. while the nasal cavity is large like a Neanderthal. So clearly we're looking at something different from both Neanderthals and Homo sapiens that was living in East Asia over 146,000 years ago. So just who was this person? Um, if we go to the next slide, now this is where the discourse really starts to begin. <laughs> um, from the Zhijun Ni et al. paper, you know, an actual phylogenetic analysis was conducted mm -hmm. with the Harbin skull. You know, a, a really nice one that includes a whole swath of human fossils, uh, 95 in all. Um, and they analyzed 234 characters. And they used both maximum parsimony and Bayesian methods to do so. Um, the tree on the left is what the authors included in the final paper. And right away, a number of things stick out. There is this huge series of splits going up the tree, you know, which includes Havilus, Ergaster, Erectus, and you know, many of these mystery hominins from the middle Pleistocene um, that have been called Homo heidelbergensis in the past. And then the Neanderthal lineage branches off, soon followed by a sister split between Homo sapiens and a lineage that includes the hardened specimen as well as a number of other mystery humans from East Asia hmm. that we talked about in episode seven, like Dali and Jin Xuan, as well as the Jahi Mandible, which is a confirmed Denisovan. Mm -hmm. Not only that, Homo ancestor is part of that lineage too. <laughs> so that's interesting. Um, not at all what the genetic and protein data has been showing for so many years. Um, this analysis suggests that Harbin, as well as the Denisovans, are more closely related to Homo sapiens than any is to the Neanderthals. Hmm. There's a, a switch of the genetic data that supports a Neanderthal Denisovan sister relationship. Um, and I mean, Homo antecessor, you know, based on the 2020 protein study, mm -hmm. was found to branch off before any of these species. So, based on this new research, the second paper by Chang Ji, who we mentioned before, um, is the official holotype designation and the taxonomic naming for the Harbin skull in particular. Uh, this is where the name Homo longi was coined. Um, I mean, the super epic dragon part of the name <laughs> just comes from the fact that it's a translation of the fossil's original location, uh, Longzhang, which means dragon river. Uh, so it's not as if this person was particularly dragon-like <laughs> personality. He was, I don't know. Um, we can only wonder. Um, but yeah, so the discourse concern is mainly based on this phylogenetic analysis, as well as the decision to give the specimen a completely new species name. Uh, on the former aspect, as I just stated, is that this new phylogeny, which is only based on morphological characters, isn't supported by the genetic data. Um, and I'm going to quote a paleoanthropologist, John Hawks, who I've mentioned before. Uh, he had quite a lot to say about this online. Um, he said, and I quote, it's not a question of DNA being right and morphology being wrong. They just tell us about different things. Morphology tells us about adaptation, convergence, and retained features from deep ancestors. DNA tells us about phylogeny, incomplete lineage sorting, and introgression. So, given what we know about the extensive admixture that was going on between all of these species, there are bound to be descendants who retain ancestral physical traits from their common ancestor and others who carry more derived physical traits. It's possible this explains why the morphological analysis found sapiens and the Harbin lineage to be closer to each other than the Neanderthals. Now, I mean, being a strictly skeletal based character data set, what happens when you constrain the data to include information from DNA and protein studies? If you go to the next slide, you get 
this. Hmm. And immediately it begins to make more sense, right? Right. Um, so there's a Denise of Neanderthal branch that shares a common ancestry with Homo sapiens, you know, going down to a series of successive splits as you travel back in time. So why wasn't this tree included in the final paper? <laughs> Simply because it produced less parsimonious results than the unconstrained tree, which is what phylogeneticists like to look for. Um, this is admittedly frustrating and I personally can't help feeling that this tree is probably more accurate. Um, just because I mean, I, I've seen many paleontologists do this sort of thing where uh, they're doing a phylogenetic analysis of fossil mammals, for example, and they always constrain their trees to the genetic data mm -hmm. you know, when mm -hmm. doing this sort of things. Yeah. Mm. So how come this case is the exception? Um, it's really strange. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I mean, like regarding this particular area of discourse, uh, Albert, I would love to get your thoughts on this. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would agree that in in this case, definitely, I think the um, a genetic evidence it, it seems strong enough that uh, it we should take this into account when running these morphological analyses. And um, I, I would also consider that a tree can constrained to the um, molecular topology um, is likely to be more accurate. Um, yeah, I, I think um, as for it being less parsimonious, I, yeah, I, I, and I think that's um, uh, kind of relating to the whole Bayesian versus parsimony debate, and though it's not strictly the same thing, um, is that, um, yeah, even though um, we do like to find the most parsimonious trees and we usually, all other things being equal, we would consider um, the most parsimonious trees that we find using parsimony um, to be the best supported trees. Um, in this case, we do have additional data from the genetics that shows us that the actual tree was probably different. And so it, in this case, uh, it's not all other things being equal, right? And uh, I think um, we have to accept that in some cases that, yeah, um, depending on the data set you use, you might it might not be the most parsimonious tree that is the correct one. Um, and so uh, not including this tree in the main text simply because it is less parsimonious, I, it doesn't it doesn't strike me as a as a very strong argument, I guess. Um, so yeah, we we do know um, like for example with when I work with birds, we we also um, have had a lot of recent um, advances and insights into uh, modern bird phylogeny from the genetics, and uh, oftentimes they're very different from what we would expect um, looking at only morphology. Um, and if we try to constrain our morphological trees to the um, genetic trees, it's true that we often do end up with much less parsimonious. Um, uh, trees in terms of like the raw, you know, uh, raw number of morphological changes that are involved. But in a lot of ways, uh, the molecular trees, uh, for various reasons, tend uh, to be more likely to give us, um, you know, the accurate topologies when we're working with, um, you know, things that actually we can actually get molecular data out of. And uh, there have been many recent advances in kind of doing molecular phylogenetics um, that help us refine that further um, and avoid uh, a lot of the biases that are involved in doing phylogenetic analyses. And so I, I do think that, uh, yeah, when, when you have very strong genetic evidence, uh, you definitely should still use it um, even if you are working with morphology. Yeah. That's generally what I was thinking too. Um, like, like the the fact that I got this tree in the first place because it was from the supplementary paper, right? And like, yeah, they, they they just they just simply said like it was less parsimonious, and they just left it at that. I was trying to look for like, you know, a breakdown of the data. Like, like they were aware of the genetic data, but they just right and with the more parsimonious tree, I guess. Even yeah. if the results were just just strange. Um, and yeah, I think also it just kind of goes to show that, I mean, the, the admixture factor mm, to this is right, probably right. very strong too. Um, given like what what we're finding now about the extensiveness of this going on within hominins, um, that's likely going to really skew any results we get if we just look at morphology alone, um, and that probably 
gives makes it a point of wondering like okay maybe many of these skulls i mean that we, that we don't have dna for maybe they're like second or third or 13th generation descendants of an admixture event between two species and that explains why they look the way they do mm -hmm. um and maybe that's that obscures the the the, the deep chronology of these relationships with with each other um, yeah it's just it's just a mess it, it seems like a big mess <laughs> um and uh I have definitely, I had definitely seen the supplementary tree shared around a little bit, and it spread all kinds of discussion, um, which of course brings us to a second aspect of the discourse, and that's the name Homo longi itself. Um, I mean, no matter what phylogeny you look at, uh, this skull is shown to be closely related to a number of enigmatic East Asian specimens, mm. as well as the Jahi mandible. I mean, it's allied particularly close to the Dolly skull, which is shown here. Um, which, incidentally, the name Homo sapiens doliensis was proposed mm. by Wu Jingxi in 1981. But he abandoned that name soon after. So on that technicality, this name is not technically, you know, it's not valid. Um, but if you look at that, if you look at the skull, and if you look at Harbin, like, they're stupidly alike. Right. Um, like, it's almost hard to tell them apart. Yet the Jietal paper is clear that they consider Harbin to have enough differences to warrant the Homo Longi name, while Dali and a specimen called Huang Longdong, uh, those two are actually closer to each other, and uh, they should probably be given the name like Homo Daliensis, um, which would give us then two distinct species inhabiting East Asia that are fairly closely related to each other during the Middle Pleistocene, um, which is interesting. Uh, However, on an even more interesting note, I mean, the Jahi mandible was found to be even closer to the Harbin skull than Dali. And, you know, I, I keep calling it the, the, the Jahi mandible. There were, like, skull bones found with that, too. Um, they just don't get talked about as much as the mandible because the mandible's fairly complete. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the fact that... Okay, so this mandible is more closer to Harbin than Dali, if we're going by these studies. Is it perhaps that Harbin is actually a perfectly complete skull of a Denisovan, you know, which we've been looking for for almost a decade. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that would be friggin' amazing, yeah. and it would help us out a lot. Um, and I mean, gee, it's all at least throw the idea out there. Um, but here's the thing. To date, Denisovans, you know, while recognized as a distinct human species, have not been formally given a scientific name. Mm -hmm because there hasn't been a good holotype to use. Um, so does that make Homo longi, or maybe Homo daliensis, if you decide to go that route, the name that we can now use for the Denisovans? Right. Um, well, there is another possible name <laughs> that we have, uh, Homo altiensis, which was proposed in 2011 by Andre Derevianko and colleagues. But again, it was not formally named. It was proposed in, the, in that particular paper. So yeah, we're in a bit of a pickle here. Mm. Um, if we find more evidence, including DNA, it's possible that this entire lineage here, you know, Dali, Jinishuan, Harbin, the Jahi Manable, all of these are Denisovans, mm. and as well as their immediate ancestors. And that would effectively solve some of the mysteries of East Asian paleoanthropology that have been around for decades. Right. Um, in that case... Um, you know, what name would be chosen will all depend on the politics of taxonomy. Um, I mean, Homo longi at least has a formal valid species description. Um, Daliensis, then followed by Altiensis, are older names, but they weren't formally published. Mm -hmm. So can we really use them at all? Um, yeah, now that this fossil and its extensive analysis are out in the open, I mean, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Yeah. Um, I don't have any stakes on what name we'll end up going with. Um, I know some anthropologists are in agreement that Homo longi is probably already bad to use to begin with mm. because of this whole discourse. Um, but at the very least, I'm willing to bet that Homo longi is the long lost Nisavin that we've been looking mm. for. Mm. Um, I mean, it, it just, it only makes sense in light of all, all, all this data that we have. Um, but that's really all I have to say on that front. Uh, Albert, 
do you have any closing thoughts on Homo Longa? Uh, yeah, um, I, I don't, of course, um, don't don't have any real stakes in what name ends up getting you used either. Um, but uh, I agree that it's really tantalizing that we might, in fact, actually have, uh, you know, honest to goodness, like complete skull of a Denisovan. That that that's just amazing. Um, and yeah, I I think it is very plausible based on. Um, what I've seen and what you've presented here, that that is indeed what it is. Yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, <laughs> there's going to be discourse for right. a long time to come, that's I'm for sure. sure. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> here's the Humanity or Prologue version of that story. So right, right. if any of you wanted the, the TLDR version. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so, <laughs> all right, let's go to the next slide now. And uh, we'll get to a, a slightly smaller but no less headline news. Mm. Um, we have had another paper from last month by uh, Israel Hertzkovitz and colleagues that proposed a second new human uh, uncovered at the site of Nesher Ramla in Israel. Uh, stone tools had been unearthed from this site over a decade ago, and it's only now that we finally have fossil material from the same area that we can connect the two with. Um, the remains, which I show here on the right, consists of a near-complete jaw with a few teeth, uh, and part of the right parietal, so that's on the, the back of the skull. Uh, and these have been dated to between 140 and 120,000 years ago, making them roughly contemporaneous with Homo sapiens as well as Neanderthals. Now, the authors have been very clear that they consider these remains distinct enough to represent an unknown lineage of humans, hmm. sharing traits that are similar to both Neanderthals and sapiens, as well as features that stand out, uh, particularly the fact that the bones are much thicker in width than either of those species. Um, thankfully, to avoid future confusion, uh, they don't propose any new names <laughs> or give any new names to these remains. Um, but the paper did speculate that we may be looking at here one of the last surviving members of the common ancestral population that gave rise to both Neanderthals and Denisovans in Eurasia, but not belonging to either of those lineages. Now, that itself sounds like a fascinating suggestion, but, you know, there was no DNA recovered from these bones, so we can't really test, you know, to say to say so. Um, I mean, beyond that, that's really all we can go on here. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, others have come forward and put, you know, an equally likely suggestion that, this vaguely Neanderthalish specimen is just an early Neanderthal itself, you know, an earlier uh, an earlier form that's hasn't gone through the derived evolution that more of our classic Neanderthals are known for, um, which would explain some of the features here. Um, I mean, we know now that a few specimens of Middle Pleistocene humans are early Neanderthals, like the Sima de los Huesos fossils, which we once called. Homo heidelbergensis, so that is not too much of a stretch. Um, of course, the distinctness of these bones, as you can see from the charts to the left, it's all morphometrics analysis. They don't do any phylogenies mm -hmm. with these remains, uh, which would probably help clarify some things. But it's, again, it's we're getting there, but not all paleoanthropologists are doing those sorts of studies. Um, now, uh, of importance to note, is that the stone tools associated with these bones are very similar to those that we know were crafted by neighboring Homo sapiens groups using the level wall technique. And the authors further speculate that this was likely due to cultural exchanges between the two, hmm. which makes a lot of sense. It seems increasingly likely that this was already going on between sapiens and Neanderthals, so why not other types of humans? Um, yeah, so... Hmm. It's a neat paper. It gives us some interesting remains, but they're not particularly complete, nor are there a lot of them. Hmm. So at the moment, we're, we're left with yet another mystery of the <laughs> Middle Pleistocene. Um, so we'll, we'll have to see where this is going to go. Hmm. Um, I guess thinking personally, do I have any stakes on this? Uh, I really don't know. Um, I it's probably just a Neanderthal of an early type, but I mean, I, I've been surprised before. Mm -hmm. um, it may, if there were more bones to go on, like Homo longi, I could be a little more confident. Right. But 
I'm just gonna kind of let these things flow in the literature and see what where we go from here. You know, yeah. If somebody wants to do a phylogenetic analysis, that would be friggin' great. <laughs> you know, right. It would right. help. But you know, this is where we are. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm sure you probably think the same way, huh, Albert? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I think uh, it's often wise to wait these things out and <laughs> let people uh, figure figure stuff out or find new specimens and such. And yeah, hopefully uh, we'll understand more in time. <laughs> yeah, because I, I mean, discourse-wise, th this is kind of a funny case. Like this, this paper was announced and people read it and a lot of responses have been, Oh, this thing's probably just a Neanderthal, and then they just left it at that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, wh wh why are we doing this to ourselves? Another new human? Come on! Um, <laughs> so, that's and I, I, I see less of this than I do with Homo one guy. Mm -hmm. So that kind of tells you like where this paper is making waves at the moment in paleoanthropology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, especially since like it's just published just so soon after or alongside Homo one guy. Um, I imagine like this got watered down in the press right. by the Homo longi just doing this. Because um, I mean, admittedly, Homo longi is a much better fossil than this. Um, I mean, it's more complete at least. Right, right. Uh, but again, it's, it's it's where we are at the moment. So yeah, let's just go to the next slide. Hmm. Um, uh, this paper uh, just came out within the last few weeks. Hmm. This is probably the most recent thing that we're going to talk about today. Um, it's by Nathan Schaefer and colleagues. And it adds some statistical data, st statistical data uh, regarding the admixture that occurred between sapiens, Neanderthals, and Denisovans. Now, by using what's known as a recombination graph inference algorithm, which you know, quantifies how many genetic traits are shared between descendant groups of a common ancestor, the authors found that in total, between 1.5 and 7% of the living human genome is unique to Homo sapiens. Hmm. And the vast majority of those genes only relate to changes in neurological development and function. Now, many of these sapien-specific genes were found to have emerged during any of two large mutation bursts, as the authors call it, uh, during our evolution. Uh, so they found one that occurred around 600,000 years ago and another occurring 200,000 years ago. And with, you know, these time, time fairly well with both the subsequent split with Neanderthals and Denisovans and with the genetic common ancestry of all living sapiens populations, respectively. Um, and this paper also confirms, as well as expands on our knowledge of admixture across Africa and Eurasia, uh, including the observation that, for example, all African populations have a very small amount of Neanderthal ancestry mm -hmm. due to back migrations um, they confirm that much of Denisovan ancestry in Eastern Eurasia and Oceania derives from sources that are separate from the original sequence DNA from Denisova Cave in Siberia. Um, and there are some really exciting results that, A, kind of add some confirmation to an earlier paper that we talked about mm -hmm. where uh, they found evidence of admixture with... Um, populations related to Denisovans and Neanderthals, but not belonging to those lineages right. among different groups in Southeast Asia and, and in the greater Eurasian landmass as a whole, which oh, I, was, I was looking forward to something like that. So we might have something more regarding that lineage. Um, hell, maybe that explains Nesher Ramla. I don't know. Mm. Um, <laughs> but uh, then B, um, they find that a lot of unique Neanderthal and Denisovan uh, genes come from the Indian subcontinent, which has been famously, you know, an untouched area of research in paleoanthropology for the longest time, but was suspected to be very important because, you know, we follow the genetic trail of sapiens throughout Eurasia. This is one of some of the earlier routes that they were taking to reach East Asia, you know, eventually. Um, so curious. Um, th th there seems to have been very important admixture events going on there that we just haven't detected previously. Mm -hmm. Um, and then C, this is kind of fun. Um, there are specific Neanderthal genes present in Oceania mm. and only there. Huh. So you know, what the hell? What is that? <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> um, what these results mean will, of course, rely on further research. Um, they don't go too deep into them in the actual paper. Uh, but they do certainly open the door to some exciting possibilities mm. of 
our human history. Right. So that's just that's just fascinating, huh? Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, let's go to the next slide uh, where we reach episode eight, where we're, now we're talking about Homo sapiens. Mm. Um, our knowledge of Africa's prehistory continues to just get better with time. And, and we've, you know, we're fortunate enough to have two new studies that shed more light into the climatic history of the continent and how it related to human evolution there. So first up is an April 2021 paper by Stephanie Kaboth Barr and colleagues that takes a long-term view of African climate change since 620,000 years ago, which is roughly, again, roughly the time since the split between Homo sapiens and the Neanderthal Denisovan lineage, uh, but also encompasses a number of mystery humans that we talked about in episode eight. Uh, in that same episode, I had mentioned that previous research indicated that the glacial interglacial cycles of the last ice age, as well as the strengthening of the monsoon in the Indian Ocean, were linked together in their roles towards their influence uh, of Africa's climate. Mm -hmm. So uh, the wet and warm periods on the continent followed interglacial cycles, and the hot and dry periods followed the glacial cycles. And this was supposed to be the major determining factor. Not so, says Kabath Bahar et al., uh, they look at 11 sites across Africa where extensive climate records are known, and they compile all of the data into a reconstructed pan-African model. And they were able to break down the climate history of the continent, at least during this time, into four phases that actually matched up more closely with the Walker circulation in the Pacific Ocean than with the global glacial cycles of the Ice Age. So basically the, the Walker circulation is this atmospheric flow of air over the equatorial regions of the world that, and, and this lies behind the El Nino and the La Nina phenomenon, mm. which, you know, creates warm and cool phases in the Pacific ocean, respectively. Um, over hundreds of thousands of years, it seems these phases created a sort of seesaw between Eastern and Western Africa, where one side experienced a wet period while the other experienced a dry period before reversing on each other. And so to get more specific, uh, so phase one, which starts 620,000 years ago, had a humid East Africa and an arid West Africa. Phase two begins 525,000 years ago, and we see these conditions flip. Mm -hmm. So now East Africa was dry, while West Africa was wet. Phase three starts 279,000 years ago with another flip. And the final phase four, which encompasses the last 128,000 years, sees the emergence of our present day, typically humid West Africa and arid East Africa. Now, such continuous swings would have played a significant role in the environmental history of the continent. Uh, and the authors found that many instances of animal evolution and extinction, as well as vegetation changes, correlate with this seesaw pattern. Hmm. Uh, it stands to reason, they argue, that human evolution during this time would have been impacted as well. Uh, the periods of time where more human fossils are known in East Africa, for example, match well with the particularly humid periods of that part of the continent. And so this suggests that conditions better allowed humans to find resources to spread out their populations. And you can see some of this in the graphic to the right, uh, better illustrated. You know, Should further research confirm these results, that would mean that most of Africa's climate history was not completely affected by the cycles of the Ice Age, but instead was predominantly based on this walker circulation mm. in the Pacific Ocean. Um, the data seems to align much better with the latter than the former, which is a far cry from what you know I'm used to reading about mm -hmm. in the literature. Right. The Ice Age is just a completely global phenomenon, mm -hmm. which it, it technically is, but right. there are areas where the influences of other factors which much higher. Mm -hmm. Now, the second paper was released last month by a Frank Shabit and colleagues, and it deals with a much shorter and more recent span of time, the, the last 200,000 years. Uh, so they're mostly concerned with the story of Homo sapiens in this case. Uh, a new sedimentary core sample was taken from uh, the site of a paleo lake called Chubahir in southern Ethiopia, uh, which is an area of the world known to have supported some of the earliest members of our species in the east. Uh, so this gave the authors a great window to explore more details about how the climate may have influenced the 
spread of humans within Africa and into Eurasia. So we're going to territory that we covered in episode nine. In that case, you know, we had discussed already the 2017 study by Jessica Tierney and colleagues that also looked at core samples towards the extreme ends of northeastern Africa, showing, you know, that warm conditions between 120 and 90,000 years ago may have allowed some of the earlier expansions of sapiens into southwest Asia, while the cooling and drying of the climate from 80,000 years ago might have pushed some sapiens populations into southwest Asia due to declining conditions. Well, this paper, first of all, takes a much you know, takes us much further back in time, as shown in the chart to the left. Uh, the core records indicate that between 200 and 125,000 years ago, this part of Africa was predominantly in a wet phase, with precipitation around 20 to 30 percent higher than the present. And this is well in agreement with the Kaboth Bahir et al. paper, showing that East Africa was experiencing its humid phase three. The lakes and rivers dominated much of the landscape, and it was within these conditions that early Homo sapiens experienced some really good times. Mm -hmm. You know, a lush environment even extended into Southwest Asia. You know, again, it confirms the results of the Chani et al. study. Uh, over the long term, however, there was a gradual decline in humidity in East Africa eventually accumulating into the arid East Africa phase four of Kabath Bahir et al. Uh, six, since 60,000 years ago, according to Shevet et al., uh, climate fluctuations have gotten more rapid, uh, you know, further causing stresses that push groups of sapiens further eastward into Eurasia, likely using special corridors that acted as refugia for plant and animal species. So yeah, all in all, this paper adds additional confirmation to what we talked about in episodes eight and nine, showing that climate change was one of the most significant factors that helped influence the evolution of Homo sapiens, as well as our spread across the world. Hmm. Uh, Albert, do you have anything you would like to add? Uh, not particularly, uh, except to say uh, this is all really fascinating, and it's always interesting to try and figure out, you know, what kind of major events in Earth history correlate with the evolution or adaptations of our groups of interest. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, it, it's just getting better and better. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen some studies that focus on the whole continent that use modeling. Mm -hmm. Right. But right. Like, with more and more core samples like this from more and more places, you know, we're finally starting to flesh out like the actual data for the climate history. And I mean, the environmental history of this continent. Right. It, it definitely gives you a more refined picture of what was happening. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, oh, and it's fascinating, too. Like, especially here, like, they compare, like, certain fossils that have been found and then how they relate to these climate swings. And, oh, it's just really interesting. Hmm. And it's really, really relevant, too, that, you know, climate is something that will always affect human beings. And Yep we'll experience much the same in the future as we have in the past. Um, it's just a question of how prepared we are for these sorts of things. Right. Um, as well as the rapidity of it, of course, because again, anthropogenic climate change <laughs> is happening significantly faster than any of this stuff that we were, that we're talking about, mm -hmm. yeah. um, which is important. So uh, yeah, let's go to the next slide. And uh, here's something fun. Uh, we're going to now show a paper that debunks an area of research hmm. we had talked about. Um, <laughs> So this is yet another paper from last month. Uh, this is by Kai Casper and colleagues. Um, so we spent some time in episode eight discussing the self-domestication hypothesis for Homo sapiens, which explains why we look so out of place compared to other human species with our globular heads, flat faces, and pointy chins. Um, one aspect of this hypothesis that has been proposed was the idea that we developed a white sclera in our eyes through this process because depigmentation is a trait of self-domestication and because they helped with communication by allowing us to read subtle cues with simple eye movements, which is, which is something that other primates didn't do. You know, like Again, they have to kind of turn their whole heads in order to follow directions. Um, this has become known as the cooperative eye hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Well, things are a lot more complicated than this, even more than I was personally expecting. Uh, it turns out that other primates can have white sclera, including all of the great apes, but it's not a universal trait. There is variation among great ape eyes. Some within the same species 
have you know dark pigmented sclera and others have a few patches of white and others have the human-like condition now you can see this here illustrated in the uh, photos on the top right the three apes you know so it's clear that you know these scleral traits do not have a underlying phylogenetic context which is interesting um with this study the authors sought to find out well just how well diverse eye whites were among all of the great apes to see whether the cooperative eye hypothesis might be missing some key information or maybe going in a wrong direction. Well, it turns out that across the hominidae clade, um, the diversity of eye whites actually forms a spectrum instead of a division. On average, orangutans and gorillas had light sclera that grew darker around the iris, but within these lineages, some species tended to have depigmented sclera while others didn't. Uh, bonobos had white sclera on average, while chimpanzees were much less so. Um, in fact, their eyes were more similar overall to the hylobetidae clade of gibbons, which have mainly depigmented eyes. Um, in fact, chimpanzees typically revert these color patterns. Their irises tend to be lighter than their sclera. Mm. And humans, in contrast, lie at the very end of this spectrum we're the odd ones out um we have none of this diversity at all um all across the board our eyes are depigmented in the same way and these results can be seen in the charts on the slide here um at the bottom right we have two phylogenetic trees uh, of apes showing the distribution of eye traits while the chart on the left is a, PS, a pca chart that kind of shows the eye traits overall and it's here where you can really see you know, the, the spectrum becoming obvious. You know, chimps fall closer to the the gibbon-like range of eye whites and, and pigmentation, while we are just way on the odd end, odd end out of it, but not fully. Um, okay, so given this information, then you have to look at what we know about visual communication in apes. Uh, it is still accurate to say that other apes rely more on physical motions like the turning of heads than the following of eyes. But the eyes do play a minor role in communication in regards to dominance versus submission. You know, it's not a good idea for a male gorilla to look another male gorilla in the eye, for example, because that implies a challenge for dominance in the troop, um, which is why when you go on like gorilla safaris, like they, they don't tell you, they tell you like, don't look at their eyes, just mm. keep a, your head down unless you want to get, you know, your, your arms broken or whatever. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Um, but, you know, when it comes to those with white sclera, other apes don't seem to use them to increase communication, as would be expected in the cooperative eye hypothesis. Um, looking at the data, that doesn't seem to follow or explain why there is such a diversity of scleral types among apes in the first place. Um, the authors do mention the possibility that this variance in white sclera may have something to do with greater social tolerance among members of the same species, but we, we, we still don't have enough research to test that. Hmm. Um, so for now, they argue it's probably best to put the cooperative eye hypothesis on the shelf, at least on a, a species level basis. Uh, things can be a lot more complicated than this hypothesis proposes. Um, and, and really, this, this study has been piggybacking off a number of other older studies that had begun to already kind of chip away at the claims of the cooperative eye hypothesis. But I mean, this is the one that this is one of the first ones to actually have a complete data set mm -hmm. from across all the different apes, as well as like more individuals within species. Like, I guess this is sort of like one of those interesting things about popular media. Uh, the studies that I had argued that apes don't have white sclera were based on studies where they only looked at maybe three individuals per species. This one had many more than that. Um, but it was always weird because, like, wildlife photographers and, and you know, zookeepers had known apes with white sclera, but those observations were kind of ignored in favor of these particular earlier studies that mm. just kind of overruled those observations. Right, right. Which is weird when that happens. Um, but yeah, what this means now is, you know, we have to look to other factors that may have influenced the evolution of our white eye condition and why, you know, they're so universal in the first place with us. Mm. Um, you know, is there something more to it than just, you know, visual communication for cooperation, uh, which is interesting. So yeah, like that, 
as far as that's concerned, that really kind of um, changes a lot of what we had already talked about in episode eight, um, including the the speculation that you know because hum- like Homo sapiens was the one who was only supposed to have eye whites, that other hominins may have only had you know pigmented eyes. Well, now that we know that about this diversity in context, well, maybe they other hominins had the same range of variation as other great apes at, to a certain extent until like whatever condition gave our species just this one condition mm-hmm. for our white sclera. Right. Which is, which is interesting. And, uh, you know, speaking of cooperation, if we go to the next slide, uh, we have two contrasting studies hmm. that look at large scale cooperation among homo sapiens for better for worse. Now, on the positive side, we have a May 2021 paper, admittedly in the preprint stage, by Robert Boyd and Peter Richardson, which offers a new perspective onto the lives of the earliest Homo sapiens. Uh, It was previously understood in the past, based mostly on ethnographic research, that nomadic forager societies tended to only cooperate with members of their own group, which consisted on average of 20 to 30 people extended maybe past 100 when you consider intergroup strangers. Um, This being on the small scale, nomadic foragers performed small scale cooperation. And it was in this context that eventually allowed humans today to network with many hundreds of individuals because we're fully able to recognize costs and benefits when working with people we don't even know personally. Basically meaning that large scale cooperation is a recent phenomenon that is in that it built up over time as networks increased well this paper says not so and argued that both archaeology and ethnographic data supports a model that since the earliest times nomadic foragers regularly engaged in large-scale cooperation with outside groups towards greater collective goods be it through communal hunts environmental construction and long-distance trade Uh, they highlight numerous examples in the literature of such activities among nomadic groups in recent times, um, as well as in the archaeological record. Uh, so to just kind of go in and name a few, uh, we have the massive driveline hunts that were choreographed by many hundreds of people to corral caribou, bison, and antelope into pits and off cliffs. And we see archaeological evidence of such behaviors going back at least 12,000 years ago, and perhaps even 400,000 years ago, if some sites are accurately interpreted. Um, then we have cases where huge amounts of labor were required to build fish traps. Uh, some Australian traps stretched roughly 650 meters across, and that would have required many hundreds of kilograms of stone to be moved um, multiple times. And people sometimes gathered in the thousands to harvest the catches. Mm. Um, we see such evidence of this going back 7,500 years ago. Uh, so then, of course, the, the widespread habitat management that we've discussed over many episodes of this series are perfect examples of large-scale cooperation for overall public good. I mean, the very act of setting fire to a landscape or constructing a dam or a canal means that every group in the area is going to benefit from the ecological releases created by such practices. Because now there's more food and water for everyone, regardless of what group you belong to. Hmm. Um, and as we've showcased plenty of times, just how far back in time those sorts of land management practices have been occurring, this means that this sort of large-scale cooperation is not new either. So, yeah, really, this image of nomadic forager groups as these sorts of family-first, small-scale collectives doesn't seem to fit very well with the actual global data. Hmm. And that means that our present-day capacity to work collectively with so many people outside our social groups is likely not so recent after all. Um, It's probably always been a common thing for Homo sapiens to come together to solve problems as a unit. Mm. And that means we need to go back to different sociological and psychological studies in light of this rediscovered information, see if we've missed anything. That's really interesting. Mm. Now, on the negative side of things, Hmm. uh, this large-scale quick collective ability also worked well for conflicts like warfare. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, the previous paper that I just talked about, you know, certainly outlined many examples of that. Um, But as a way to kind of update an aspect of this series, uh, we're going to turn now to a May 2021 paper by Isabel uh, Krivikor and colleagues that 
reinterprets the 14 to 12,000 year old site of Jebel Shahaba in Sudan. In episode eight, we had mentioned that this was a cemetery that housed the remains of 61 people who had all died violently. Um, about 45% of the bones uh, of the remains show that the people had been killed with spears and arrows. Um, and that this was likely the result of a wartime event between competing foragers over a resource rich landscape. Well, according to this paper, it seems less likely that this site was dedicated to a singular war after all. Uh, there's been new dating directly that's been done on the site that shows that, first of all, the Jebel Shahaba is between 18.2 and 13.4 thousand years ago. So yeah, it's still pretty old, but much older than we've been thinking about. Um, and for, for another matter, we have new human remains that have been unearthed from this site. Um, in fact, if you look at the chart to the right, um, the bo the bodies with green dots show, you know, new um, new individuals that have been uncovered from the site. And you can see there's quite a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's been research that's been done on these new remains, as well as some of the old ones that, that people have gone back to and they re-examined. And it seems that while a fair number of people here were buried after, you know, having been attacked, many others actually sported healed bones. Hmm. And so these findings told the authors that Jebel Shahaba acted as a cemetery where people were buried following multiple wars hmm. uh, between communities that were semi-sedentary foragers, as we alluded to in episode eight. So yeah, just, you know, just a little clarification about the site. Um, it was a long-term cemetery for victims of war, but not necessarily ones that followed immediately after a single wartime event. Mm. You know, this included casualties as well as maybe veterans, if you will. Right. So that's pretty fascinating. Uh, what do you think, Albert? Yeah, uh, grisly, but um, definitely shed some light on how these people were living. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide now. And uh, we go to episode nine around the world. And, uh, oh, look, it's our friend, the Toba eruption. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I admittedly came down hard on the research that's been done on this event from 75,000 years ago or so. Um, so just to kind of state the record again, um, this was something that happened. But while we can't say for sure what the total effect was on human populations during the time, it does not appear to have been the super terrible near extinction causing event that it's so often reported to be this, this idea that this you know, the volcano erupted it caused this like the six year volcanic winter and the right. whole human population was reduced to just a handful of peeps um which you know what this is actually really hilarious to me hmm. and also kind of sinister people use toba as an excuse not to worry about climate change today mm. Because they say, oh, well, if the human population was reduced so much during this event, that look, we're all still here. That means that it's not going to be that bad yeah. down the line. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, which is like, um, again, completely different things we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. um, wow, it's ridiculousness, you know. Um, but yeah, uh, if this paper from last month by Benjamin Black and colleagues has anything else to add, it's that its effect on climate may have been more pronounced than its effect on humanity. Hmm. Now, granted, the authors try to reconcile paleoclimate records from around the world with a high-resolution Earth system simulatory model to see what sorts of climatic impact, uh, impacts might have occurred through various factors, like the levels of sulfur release from the volcano and the time and season of year for the eruption. Curiously, what they found in all cases did match the lack of records for volcanic conditions seen in Africa, India, and Southeast Asia. But it was throughout the Northern Hemisphere where a significant cooling of climate was seen to occur with temperatures of, you know, at four degrees Celsius colder following a few years after the eruption. And that's interesting to know. And it would really help to look at, you know, any actual climate records of North America, Europe, and Siberia to see if things do match up like this after all. Um, and another instance of hypotheses that always seem to keep showing up, um, the authors do speculate that 
because the Neanderthals, the Nisivans, you know, lived in northern Eurasia, um, that they, they may have faced serious problems from the super eruption more than Homo sapiens did. Um, and again, you know, this remains to be seen. But you know, I, I've already made it clear that Neanderthal workers are very skeptical that any sort of volcanic eruption would have been enough to cause long-term problems for this population. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, there's that. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. And uh, now we have an April 2021 paper by Corey Bradshaw and colleagues, big name in Australian anthropology, um, that also uses modeling to answer questions about the human story. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, the authors wanted to figure out the timing and speed in which Sahul, so that's the ancient landmass that included Australia, New Guinea, mm -hmm. and Tasmania, as you can see here. Um, they wanted to see, you know, how quick uh, that continent was peopled by Homo sapiens. Now, the authors admit that we're still unclear just when sapiens first laid foot on the landmass in the first place. Um, at the moment, we have two options, at least. Uh, we have the one based on genetic data that points to a settlement around 50,000 years ago. And then one based mainly on the Majibebe site, which has been dated through the thermoluminescence method to 65,000 years ago. Well, taking these two options at least, they then made a stochastic cellular automation model, which is you know basically a computer model that can replicate cell-like growth over time, you know, as long as you want to put it for, uh, which they used to perform 120 scenarios that were each factored in with different criteria, including known archaeological sites and their dates, uh, past environmental changes in Sahul, and even population densities. And what they found was that regardless of when, 65 or 50,000 years ago or so, the entire continent was populated within a very rapid period of time. They estimate that it took between 5,600 and 4,300 years for people to go from the northwest to the southeast. And what's interesting here is that this matches previous discussions that the continent was peopled quickly. I mean, we know that people were already in southern Sahul by 49 to 45,000 years ago, which is not that long after the earliest definitive dates. Um, and they indicate, as a bit of a curious find, that the population densities of these earliest migrants were actually fairly large. Hmm which does match some archaeological observations, like the fact that the Majabebe site, um, which sports one of the highest concentrations of stone tools than any other Australian site during you know, the, the late Pleistocene. So, yeah, these models also generally agree with an entry somewhere in the Northeast, which, again, that also matches what is known from research in Southeast Asia. And the authors have been able to use this sort of modeling to extend their speculation about the main Eurasian expansion of Homo sapiens, too. Um, they suggest that it took at least 15 and a half to 12,000 years for people to expand from East Africa to Sahul, hmm. which seems you know, more than enough time right. for populations to become adjusted to such different regions. So that's pretty fun. Yeah. Um, now, all right, let's go to the next slide. And uh, we just have a, a couple papers on this slide to help flesh out and update episode nine. Um, so we mentioned a contentious area of research in East Asia regarding the presence of early Homo sapiens teeth, particularly those of Fuyan Cave in Southern China that were dated uh, to between 120 and 80,000 years ago, which is a big, big game changer in this discussion. Um, so back in February 2021, uh, as we had talked about, Darren Curnow and colleagues had performed their own tests at the site using new remains and without consultation from the previous researchers who worked here uh, to argue that these early dates are likely not accurate and that the site was actually early Holocene in age. To which some of the original researchers, including Maria Marington Torres, came out and said that this work was suspect and highly flawed. Well, we can now fast forward in time to June and their responses have finally been published in two letters to the journal Penis. Hmm. And one of the papers by TFG Higgum and K. Duca argue, one, that the dating methods used in the Kerno et al. study were actually unreliable. Hmm. Um, to quote them, 
the pretreatment chemistry methods used to derive their accelerator mass spectrometry dates are not reported. They fail to define the nature of the data material and the limited analytical data fall almost completely outside accepted parameters, raising doubts over accuracy. So then the other paper comes from Marinton Torres and colleagues, and they found that the human teeth used by Kurnow's team are actually not human at all, hmm. but they come from a deer. <laughs> oh. Yeah, uh, the reason for this discrepancy was that the team didn't perform a morphometric analysis and just assumed that the teeth were, and I quote, clearly human right because they matched those found earlier so yeah that's that's quite the mess there um seems a little bit more of a wrench into that area of study mm -hmm. um, yeah so uh, on more concrete terms uh next up we have an april 2021 paper by uh, Majia hajinjak and colleagues uh, where ancient dna has been extracted from sapiens remains in bacha kiro cave in bulgaria between 45.9 and 42 and a half thousand years ago. This makes them some of the earliest known members of our species uh, following the earlier expansions from like 100,000 years ago or so uh, to have made a home in Europe. And we know from their remains that they utilized the Bohunistian toolkit, which as we explained in episode nine, has been proposed to represent a distinct movement into Europe uh, during an environmentally stable time around 50,000 years ago after which a cold snap around 40,000 years ago seems to have pushed people southwards, bringing the Bohunusian toolkit to a close. Now, these movements have not been detected in the genetic record of sapiens, but with this study, we might actually have our first documented record. Hmm. Uh, specifically, the study found that the Bachukiro individuals shared more genes with populations in eastern Eurasia and the Americas than with later Europeans of the Aurignacian culture. In fact, they contributed little to no ancestry to those groups. Now, the presence of Neanderthals in this part of the world had been previously confirmed. You know, we know that they coexisted with the Bohunissians. And it's thanks to this study that we know that all the individuals sequenced share a very recent Neanderthal ancestor within just six or seven generations. Now, to be clear, this paper does not use the word Bohunissian, but it refers to their toolkit instead as the initial Upper Paleolithic. Um, however, if you look at the literature, the two words basically mean the same thing. Um, so I, I think the comparison checks out there on that front. Um, you know, it will be interesting to see if further ancient DNA is acquired from these early Eastern European sites and whether you know there's more support for this first movement of peoples into Europe that did not contribute to the later um, uh, forager Mesolithic populations that are well known in ancient DNA studies. Right. Uh, so lastly here, we have two papers that add more information to the story of South America's people. The first up is a mitochondrial genomic study from May 2021 by Xavier Rocarada and colleagues that focuses on the southern tip of South America, where 18 individuals from the Argentine Pampa to Tierra del Fuego were examined. Um, in episode nine, we didn't go too deep into the population history of South America, but we did state that it was you know, a complex affair that followed soon after the first settlement around 15,000 years ago. Well, this paper does confirm the early settlement date, and specifically they bumped that to 15.6 thousand years ago. And it reveals that mitochondrial diversity was very high mm. in the early years, eventually declining following events, including a recently understood population turnover. It seems to have affected most of South America around 9,000 years ago. And I say most, because some of the new sequences that were found in the study uh, seem to continue to carry an this ancestry from these earliest times into the present day. So that means that this population turnover was not as severe in the South as it seems to have been in the North. Now, in regards to information about possible routes of expansion, the authors believe that the most likely paths people took when they first settled the Southern Cone was either from inland or from an Atlantic coastal route, probably from the Pampas region. Uh, they argue, interestingly, that the Patagonian ice sheet, which would have been around 15.6 thousand years ago, might have been too hazardous for people taking a Pacific coastal route. Um, now, this all remains to be seen, of course. I mean, it's difficult to ascertain exact routes with these sorts of studies, but it does imply that the Pacific coastal route probably was not the 
the only way that people entered South America. Right. Uh, they may have taken their own detours and then went Atlantic wise. Now, the second South America study is from April 2021 by Marcos Araujo Casto y Silva and colleagues. And it concerns the mysterious population Y. So we talked a bit about this in, in episode nine. Uh, population Y is this genetic signal that was first detected in DNA studies on Tupi-speaking Amazonian populations from 2015, which seemed to stem from Oceanian and East Asian sources as a separate source from the founding populations that peopled the Americas. Now, this raised a lot of eyebrows, and some researchers thought that this was an error in translation. Mm. Well, now, thanks to this research, which looked at previous genetic sequences from both sides of the Pacific, we can now confirm that population Y you know, is not a fluke. It's a genuine signal. And fascinatingly, it's also been detected now on the Pacific side of the Andes, huh. among the Chatuna people, who are descendants of the, the Moche culture that we talked about in episode 12, um, as well as other Amazonian groups who speak languages from other families beyond Tupian. So the signal is now known to be fairly widespread in South America. Um, but how, where, and when did it come from? Hmm. Now, at the moment, the authors conclude that the source of the signal seems to stem from the West along a Pacific coastal route, and that it established itself on the continent before the populations of the Andes and Amazonia began to acquire their own distinct genes. Um, there's no data that could be gleaned from timing, unfortunately, but we know that the population Y signal is present in deep diverging Oceanian and Eurasian groups, uh, no, most notably the Aboriginal Australians, uh, Papuans of New Guinea, uh, the Andamanese of the Andaman Islands, uh, as well as the, the Tanyuan population of 40,000 years ago, which was in East Asia at the time, um, but is not found in later East Asian groups or Amerindians. Now, the authors state that in light of previous research, a source in Northeast Eurasia, alongside the ancestors of both ancient Beringians and all other Amerindians, seems to be the most likely scenario. Uh, they don't go with the possibility of a separate Southeast Asian source population, uh, which would have more likely hugged the Pacific coasts rather than make a transatlantic voyage, um, which that's very unlikely. Hmm. Um, but anything the study at least demonstrates that population Y, whatever it was, you know, is real, and it contributed in a major way to the peopling of South America. Um yeah, so do you have anything to add about that, Albert? Uh, not especially, uh, but yeah, it, it is cool as always to see the picture, you know, get refined further. Oh yeah, and I, I, I'm very curious, like as, as more ancient DNA research is done throughout the Americas, whether we will see this, this signal in other places beyond South America. Mm, right. Because to clarify today, it's just within these groups in South America. We don't see it in Central America. We don't see it in North America or even among like Arctic groups. Mm -hmm. So if it came from a Pacific coastal route, like there's questions about how that worked then. Like, okay, if these, do these guys just go all the way straight to South America, do they not settle anywhere else? Right. Um, right. It, it's very curious. It's just, it's just the timing. We really need the timing data because at this moment we, we don't know. Um, and I think that will help us really answer some more questions. Um, because uh, I'm still curious whether this population Y might have something to do with some of these really early archaeological sites we've been finding in the Americas that aren't represented in the genetic data because we just don't have the remains from these peoples. And that's something that happened. Uh, I, I'm very curious about that. I don't know if anybody else has speculated on that front. Right. Um, because more of these early dates have been are being found to... You know, during and before the last glacial maximum, um, you know whether population Y was here first before the other Amerindian groups, or some a reversal of that. It, it it's all very new research, so yeah. uh, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing more on that. So, all right, let's go to the next slide um, where we reach episode ten, where things are are winding to a close for this episode. Um, we introduced a chart in episode ten that outlined the average global temperatures and CO2 content throughout the Holocene Epoch, nice. you know, further clarifying the details across episodes 11 and 12. Uh, in general, 
we explained that there was a gradual rise in temperatures during the start of the epoch as the glaciers in the northern hemisphere were melting, uh, followed by a period called the Holocene climatic optimum. You know, this warm period lasted around 5,000 years that turned much of the Earth's landscape into fertile regions, which supported the spread of agriculture, which ended with the 4.2 kiloyear event, which some researchers have controversially argued caused a massive global cooling and drying event that brought a decline in average temperatures before the rise of anthropogenic warming, giving us our unprecedented state today. You know, that has been the model of Holocene climate change that we followed in this series, but perhaps it's not fully accurate. Uh, as this January 2021 paper by Samantha Bova and colleagues concludes. Now, among paleoclimate workers, there's this thing called the Holocene temperature conundrum. Uh, previous models of past climates have more or less recovered the pattern I have just explained. But when you examine the actual CO2 records from ice and sediment samples, for example, there isn't a clean match between the two. I mean, we know that the concentration of greenhouse gases in the air and the average global temperature happens in a lockstep motion. I mean, we see this with current climate records today. So how come this isn't seen over the past 12,000 years? It turns out that there's more than one way to map global air temperatures over time. You can look at things seasonally, where you focus on the average summer or mm -hmm. winter per year. Right. Or you can look at things annually where all the seasons are included to make a sum total average. Um, you know, to realistically examine global climate change over time, it's better to look at mean annual air temperatures than seasonal temperatures. And that's exactly what the authors of the study needed to do. So they relied on a marine core sample taken from the Sepik River in New Guinea, which is chock full of the shells of long dead microbes called foraminifera, which are helpful in recording past climates. Um, and then they took that and advised the means to calculate the average annual temperatures from the seasonal ones. To do this, they analyzed seasonal records of the oldest layers of the sample, which goes back to the last interglacial period, beginning 128,000 years ago, um, before the current one, which is the Holocene. Um, and they calculated for sensitivity towards exposure to solar radiation. And they then removed those sensitivities to produce the annual temperature. And they chose this earlier interglacial period specifically because researchers have known that this time had much stronger seasonal differences than the Holocene interglacial. So it, it was easier to test calculations for sensitivity. Now, with all of that done, they could then go back to all sorts of previous samples and do the same thing. And they find that indeed all of these studies were showing these seasonal temperatures, not the annual ones. So they were basically able to fix the Holocene temperature conundrum. Indeed, once you map out the mean average air temperature, it does match far more closely to these CO2 records than when you map out seasonal temps. Hmm. And the chart at the right beautifully illustrates that for sure. The seasonal temps are here, this yellow bar, what we talked about in the series. And then the uh, purple to red bar is what the study actually finds. Um, the authors could now more accurately describe the climate history of the Holocene. Uh, indeed, there was you know, a gradual increase in temperatures in the early Holocene that was caused by the melting of the great glaciers. But rather than reach an optimum and short drop, global temperatures just continued to follow a steady rise. It turns out that this rise was mostly facilitated by the increasing spread of agricultural practices mm -hmm. since 6,500 years ago, which released a fair number of greenhouse gas emissions through practices like deforestation, which releases CO2, and certain farming practices like rice puddling, which releases methane. Um, it's only with the rise in industrialization that fossil fuels became the major source of emissions, as seen in the rapid spike within the last few centuries. Now, this realization further changes the way we look at the Holocene, because when the researchers compared the new annual temp calculations with those of the last interglacial, they found that the two were actually very different in scope. The Holocene isn't just another interglacial period, it's unique in that the last glacial maximum left us with fairly large glaciers at its start, compared to the last interglacial when ice cover in the northern hemisphere was more reduced, and that we find, uh, and that we had this growing phenomenon of greenhouse gas emissions that were rising temperatures, whereas the last interglacial period was found to have a stable greenhouse level across the board. Um, 
So what does this mean then for known periods of time like the Holocene climatic optimum? I mean, we know that things were more lusher in the Sahara, for example. I mean, that, that doesn't just go away with this data. Um, well, the authors state that these are better explained as regional seasonal events, like the medieval warm period or the Little Ice Age of more recent years. Um, these are well recorded in climate records in the Northern Hemisphere, but they do not make any significant dents when looking at the average climate overall. Um, it's actually really funny. Things get really cold during the Little Ice Age in the North, and yet you still see this rise in temperatures throughout the world overall. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, now that we have a means to better calculate annual from seasonal average temperatures, um, which we haven't had before, other paleoclimate researchers can now go to their data and correct for these discrepancies, mm -hmm. which will allow us to better understand just how climate change affected human history. And they can help confirm or tweak the results found in this study, which is really the first of its kind. Um, so that's pretty neat. What do you think? Yeah, I I would agree. Um, I'm not a um, climate scientist, of course, but um, it does seem to me that this is potentially a very important study. And um, I think if... Um, these results hold, uh, they really highlight uh, both the fact that human activity has had an impact on the climate for a long time, but also the fact that uh, we live in an extremely unprecedented times in terms of how rapid and extreme the climate is changing now. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And uh, yeah, I, I've been holding this one in for a while now. Hmm. Uh, going back to that age-old discourse about the extinction of the megafauna. Uh, yeah. yeah, when we last left the subject in episode 10, you know, I had reached a personal verdict that the events that contributed to so many species losses were probably very complex and multifaceted, and it's unlikely that human overkill or rapid climate change are solely to blame for all of the deaths, mm -hmm. um, and that's where I left it. And since that time, I've been able to read up more on the literature and witness some of the discourse firsthand, um, especially following the publication of a Tetrapod Zoology article, which was simply a review of The Missing Links by Ross Barnett. And I'll, I'll link that article here in the description. Um, this book discusses animals that have disappeared from the British Isles since the last ice age. And at one point, Darren Nash states that he's an advocate of human hunting being the main cause of megafaunal extinctions in the past, as well as the present. Uh, to which, and I'm being purposely polite here, a very lively and extended conversation took place in the comment section. <laughs> as expected. You know, as, as, yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, that certainly demonstrated to me that this discourse is still as strong as ever. Um, now, one of my main concerns about this whole thing comes down to the data itself. You know, we have species distributions through time and geography. We have the earliest dates uh, for human occupation so far uh, and dates for more widespread distributions of human populations. And sometimes things correlate and other times they don't. And so we enter Gilbert J. Price, who is a paleontologist from the University of Queensland in Australia, mm -hmm. who put up a comment with his thoughts as well as links to his work. Uh, he has previously highlighted his own issues with research in megafaunal extinctions. Um, so in an article he wrote with multiple colleagues, uh, he called to question meta-analyses, which are these big studies that pull in all sorts of data from multiple earlier research and compile them into a statistical review in order to find out the state of affairs on any given situation. Um, uh, in this case, um, meta-analyses are used to comb data sets for anything related to the extinction dates for specific megafauna, uh, first human contact, etc. And then these are used in combination with paleoclimate data to find out which factors, humans or climate, best match the information. But what a lot of people, and specialists and otherwise, often don't realize, and this is really the crux of Price's argument, is that the actual data used in these meta-analyses are mostly inefficient, contested, and even outdated. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of Australia's megafauna, for example, which I famously didn't touch all that much in Humanity of Prologue because of the lack of data, um, we don't actually have any good evidence for just how long many of those species have been around, much less you know how widespread the distributions are and just when they died out. 
um, and a really shocking statistic, 30% of known Australian megafauna have never been dated. Hmm. Um, we only have a handful of species for which the data is good enough to look into. And this is mostly reserved for well, well-known animals like the woolly mammoth or the European cave lion. Um, and that's about it. I mean, we don't even have proper data for the hundreds of megafauna that are known to have existed, at least during the Pleistocene. Mm. Um, if that's the case, you know, who are we to suggest that any source, humans or climate, is responsible for their absence in the present day when we don't even know much about their histories at all? Right. Um, and, you know, to repeat again from episode 10, a lot of this discourse is simply because experts in different fields like archaeology or paleontology aren't communicating with each other. Uh, you know, they're actually, you know, they're not putting together what they know to paint a more complex picture of the times and places that you know, we're all concerned with. Right. And we've already seen examples of recent studies that have called into question key assumptions from past arguments. Um, we have the, the Louise et al. study from our March 2021 news episode, you know, in which the authors stated that human activity wasn't a likely factor in the extinctions of the island megafauna during the Pleistocene because their technology and culture were distinct enough from recent times that they wouldn't have had the same effects that people during the Holocene brought about, you know, you know, being agriculturalists. For example, like in the ways that they had wiped out species in New Zealand or Madagascar, for example. Um, you know, you're actually paying attention to the life histories of human societies for a change, rather than, you know, viewing human hunters as this regular static force, um, as many overkill proponents have basically done. Mm. You know, mm. we're really good hunters from the beginning to the end with no change in between. Um, so at this point, I'm going to kind of retcon my thoughts a little bit hmm. from episode 10. Um, it still seems reasonable to say that the story of megafaunal extinctions was a complex issue, but in the absence of actual good data as revealed by this, by this article and other research, um, I feel like we have a long way to go before we can even properly address it in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um, to echo from Price's article, you know, we need actual accurately acquired dates. We need more specimens across a wider geographic spread. And especially we need more conversations between distinct fields, including a more holistic understanding of prehistoric climates, human cultures, and ecologies. Um, so I, I, I really hesitate to, to touch this with a, with a six foot pole. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, uh, I'm curious if you have anything to add about this, Albert. Um, I, I don't really think I do, but um, yeah, I, I think this, this really does just highlight exactly how ambiguous the, our understanding of this topic actually is. Um, and yeah, it does seem uh, perhaps unwise to, to jump to any conclusions at the moment. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, and this is really interesting too, like uh, the main reason that, you know, um, oh, um, with Gilbert Price's comment, like he had noticed, like in that comment section, like, you know, people are going back and forth about it's hunting, it's, it's climate, it's right. this and it's that. Um, a lot of misconceptions based on these meta analyses that are very flawed mm. have just trickled down into the, into popular literature so much that even well-meaning researchers throw them out, right. even though they've, they've been debunked for a while now. Mm. Um, and that that's not good. You know, that that's not a good <laughs> situation right. to be in. Um, so yeah, I, I think we need a lot more time for sure before we can really dig deep into this, but it is a fascinating case. And I mean, at the very least, we can be confident that the world today is very impoverished from just a couple thousand years ago or so. Absolutely. In, in terms of like the number of species, even large species that we know were around at the very least, it's just a question of where did they all go? Mm -hmm. um, and I think for now, I'm, I'm very comfortable saying we don't know <laughs> and just kind of leave it there. Um, so, yeah, let's go to the next slide and let's move away a bit towards some lighter news. Um, we have two papers that shed more light on human population replacements as they occurred during the final years of the Pleistocene. Uh, the first concerning Europe is a paper from last month by Eugenio Bortolini and colleagues. Throughout episode 9 and into episode 10, we had reviewed the cultural history of Homo sapiens in Europe, starting with the Aurignacians and ending with the Magdalenians and the Epigravitians, after which around 14,000 years ago, forager groups from Southwest Asia uh, crossed into Europe during the Bulling-Alarod interstitial, so the 
a warm period before the cooling of the Younger Dryas, and admixed with the people there to produce the basic Western forager population that started Europe's Mesolithic period. Well, this study concerns newly sequenced ancient DNA from the jawbone of a human, shown here, uh, who lived between 16.9 and 16 and a half thousand years ago in what is now Veneto, Italy. Uh, the researchers found that this person's DNA matches that of the incoming foragers from the Southwest to a T, and they belong to what's known as the Villa Bruna cluster, uh, according to ancient geneticists. Um, that means that we now have to backtrack the occurrence of this population expansion to at least 17,000 years ago and not 14,000 years ago, which puts it before the time when the Bjolling Alarad interstitial commenced. And this also means that the Epigravetian peoples consist of two distinct populations. We have the early ones of 21,000 years ago that are known to have descended from the in-situ foragers, while the Villa Bruna cluster could represent the later Epigravetians in the region. And there is actually some archaeological evidence, it turns out, that shows a discontinuity between these two types at around 17,000 years ago, when this new genetic signal appears in Europe. Um, yeah, very curious. But then that begs the question, why did these people move into Europe during a time so soon after the peak cold of the last glacial maximum, and not during that later warmer period? Um, alas, that's another mystery to investigate. Hmm. Then we have this other paper about Eastern Eurasia, which is also from last month, by uh, Zhao Wei Miao and colleagues. Uh, the Paleolithic of East Asia is another area that is a rather patchy affair that's only now being better explored by new research in archaeology and ancient DNA. And this study adds to that knowledge, as there are now 25 new genetic sequences from individuals who lived in the Amur region of southeastern Russia, which is near the border of China, uh, who lived between 33.6 and 3.4 thousand years ago. Uh, these remains help close a gap in ancient DNA for this part of the world between the oldest known genes from the Tianyuan person of 40,000 years ago and later East Asians. And now, when all of these sequences, old and new, were compared with each other, they revealed a previously unknown population turnover mm. in which humans with Tianyuan-like ancestry were gradually replaced by humans from, other, from another southern source by 19,000 years ago, after which they became the most widespread population in northern East Asia. Now, curiously, the genes of these people are closely related to Paleo-Siberians, who we know underwent their own population replacement of ancient North Eurasians in eastern Siberia beginning 20,000 years ago. So these are likely representing the same event that was occurring. Uh, eventually, as explained in episode 10, uh, these groups would gradually find themselves undergoing a demographic transition as people with new ancestry emerged from the south, the ancestors of the Neo-Siberians. Um, but they did not outright replace all the Paleo-Siberians, obviously. And this new paper adds the interesting note that these groups have maintained genetic continuity in the Amur region for the last 14,000 years. So that's kind of really cool. Um, yeah. Again, different papers are comparing... Uh, or finding comparable results that tell a much wider story, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Always um, nice when it happens. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so now, oh, oh boy, we come to perhaps the most radical change necessary for humanity, a prologue. Oh, yeah? Yeah, if we could go to the next slide. Um, for all the environmental and population history discussed in episode 10, the main focus of this part of the series was on the origins of sedentism and how the changes that took place following the last glacial maximum and the younger Dryas allowed humans to take up new kinds of societies than the nomadic ones, which had been the norm since our evolution hundreds of thousands of years ago. Uh, it was now during the cusp of the Holocene that many aspects of recent human history from food storage and job specialization to social stratification, governance, slavery, and large-scale warfare originated. And it was under these conditions that plant and animal domestication, followed by agriculture and urbanism, commenced. Uh, this has been the general story of human prehistory that has been told and shared by specialists and you know the popular liter literature and the media for decades. And that is how I've had intentionally organized this series. So what would you say if I told you that this narrative is probably highly inaccurate? 
Damn. <laughs> <laughs> um, it turns out that a number of anthropologists have been arguing as such for many years now. And the most prominent have been archaeologist David Wengro and the unfortunately late sociocultural anthropologist David Graeber, who passed away last year, um, who have spent so many years going into countless ethnographic studies, archaeological literature, and historical records from scholars centuries past, that they've been able to finally publish a book that synthesizes their work. Uh, it's due to come out in the UK in October of this year, in the US the following month, and it's called The Dawn of Everything, hmm. A New History of Humanity. I'll put a link in the description for you guys to pre-order, um, or order depending on when you're seeing this episode. Um, uh, this book promises to be a, a landmark publication, and a bunch of big names in anthropology have already you know, had positive things to say about it already. Hmm. Um, so I'm going to try to summarize as best I can, but in essence, their work indicates that early human societies were far more diverse than the standard nomadic model than you then previously understood, and that they were all composed of individuals who were consciously aware of their own governance. You know, it's not as if humans knew nothing about politics or social stratification before the end of the LGM, you know, being in a, in a state of innocence, as you will. Um, in fact, it appears to have been something that's been with us since the beginning. Um, to start, there have been a number of recent research that outlines our knowledge of forager societies beyond a simple nomadic sedentary model, as I've admittedly followed in this series. Um, one such paper is from March 2021, still in the preprint, by Manver Singh and Luke Glowacki. Now, I've mentioned Singh a tiny bit in episode 8 in regards to his article about historical research with African foragers. So I'm glad to see that he's gone forward and published his findings. Um, here, the authors put forth a diverse histories model, which is just what it sounds like. Hmm. Since at least 130,000 years ago, humans have developed a number of different ways of life around the world, each with their own distinct social organizations and resource hmm. management. Far back in time, beyond the Holocene, you had sedentary societies that utilized leadership through inherited status or leadership shared among the council. You had nomadic groups that linked up during certain seasons and formed temporary alliances consisting of hundreds of people. And you had groups that experimented with plant and animal management thousands of years before the earliest known domesticated crops and livestock. Now, the map at the top left highlights some of these findings, showing that far from being uncommon, sedentary forager societies have actually been widespread and occurred in places that lacked the sort of net primary productivity that many researchers presumed was a prerequisite for supporting high population densities. Hmm. Uh, any of these groups made use of aquatic resources, and there is archaeological evidence of large-scale, systematically collected shell middens going back to Africa's Middle Stone Age, meaning that previously discussed sites in the series, like Blombos Cave or Classy's River Cave, may best be reinterpreted as more sedentary in nature than is usually presumed. Hmm. And it does not stop there. Graeber and Wengrow's work indicates that early human societies were so diverse that they could even switch between socio-political orders by choice and not, necess not necessarily by necessity. Now, these are known as double morphologies, and though they may sound strange at first, the more you look at the ethnographic literature, the more they make sense. Um, it's been actually known for many years now that Inuit groups in the Canadian Arctic undergo this strategy. Uh, during summertime, groups are dispersed in a typical nomadic fashion, led by a strict and dominating elder man, going after whatever animal life is available, and then building these temporary campsites. But then when winter approaches, all of these groups coalesce to form these huge wooden bone houses where they'll stay put as a collective and share whatever resources are hunted from the ice. And without any issue, the harsh leaders of the summer months step down from their posts. And there's no really like main leadership among this entire collective. And, you know, this new and rediscovered research even extends into more recent times with, you know, the key sites of early agriculture and urbanization, as mentioned in episodes 11 and 12. Um, I had already mentioned that there was no such thing as an agricultural revolution and that the transition to full-time farming was the end of a long period of landscape management with wild gardens and animal taming. Um, with this understanding of diverse histories and double morphologies, it seems more likely that many of the first agricultural societies may have actually changed their subsistence strategies seasonally as well. Um, I mean, think about what happened 
with the Natufians. You know, they developed farming techniques, but had to ditch them for foraging strategies when the younger Dryas hit. Yet they held on to the knowledge of farming and passed it on to their descendants, who became farmers once again. Now imagine that on a smaller, a, a more purposeful scale. And, you know, we can also now better understand the nature of agriculture's spread, too. Um, there was a lot of evidence to show that, you know, when farming was first introduced to Europe, the peoples of the British Isles, in particular, originally took up these cereal crops, but then later abandoned the practice around 5,300 years ago to focus on the foraging of hazelnuts as their primary food source. Mm. Um, this means that even if agriculture spread into a region populated by foragers, that doesn't necessarily mean that the foragers will readily pick it up in full, if at all. And in regards to urbanization, you know, we find that the standard model of early cities has problems. You know, labor divisions and centralized governments that were long used as criteria to define a city tend to not get established until thousands of years after their actual founding. Instead, many early cities seem to have experimented with many different social orders as well. Um, across the Americas and Eurasia. I mean, we find examples of cultures like Shadokoyak, the, the Indus Valley, the Kukuteni Tripilian, the Minoan, the pre-dynastic Sumerian, the early Southern Chinese, Norde Chico, and Teotihuacan that all seem to have been constructed and organized, and here I'm going to quote Graeber and Wengro specifically, on self-consciously egalitarian lines, municipal councils retaining significant autonomy from central government, with sophisticated civic infrastructures, with no trace of royal burials or monuments, no standing armies or other means of large-scale coercion, nor any hint of direct bureaucratic control over most citizens' lives. Uh, even in Cortez's day, central Mexico was still home to cities like Tlaxaca, run by an elected council whose members were periodically whipped by their constituents to remind them who was ultimately in charge. Now, this is all a far cry from what is usually explained in scientific and popular media. And you know, it really shows how easy it is for us to let a good story that makes sense get in the way of, like, actual evidence from the archaeological and historical mm. record. Again, it's not like all of it is necessarily brand new information. I was just pulled out of thin air. You know, in many cases, anthropologists have known about these things for years, but it's often either obscured away in university libraries or just ignored. And that's not okay. Um, I mean, if we're all so concerned about the big questions of humanity, then we need to make sure we pay attention to what all these observations and excavations have been telling us. And in many cases, go back to the drawing board about everything from human psychology to political theory, which is admittedly no small feat, but it is necessary in light of this understanding mm -hmm. um, that our story of the origins of scientism and agriculture and urbanization are not so clear cut as we've been telling ourselves for years, but in fact, people have been experimenting with all sorts of ways of life since they were, you know, but since before they were homo sapiens. Right. Um, so yeah, if I was to, if I was in a position to redo humanity, a prologue, this is probably the area where most changes would be made. Wow. Even as far as like organizing the episodes is concerned. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, Albert, what do you think about all of this? Whoa, I mean, yeah, I, I had not really been familiar with any of this at all. And obviously, this is a huge change in how um, we should probably be approaching this narrative. And yeah, wow. Uh, I, I I guess I, I look forward to see how, how people decide to restructure it in the future. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, with with this in mind, you know, it's all these all these common sayings that you know, anthropologists and whatnot have been using for, for years and years, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, 95% of our history, we, we were hunter gatherers. It's like, well, no, it's, it's, it's more complex than that. Um, and it really like demonstrates how much, how much we have to go before we can like really understand paleolithic societies. Mm -hmm. Um, just amazing stuff. Um, well then, I mean, we have just one more story to talk about and it's last but not least, if we go to the next slide, All right. um, I had ended episode nine with a brief aside about Antarctica, you know, being the only continent on earth to have been spared by the great population expansions of homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. And for obvious reasons, it's a very cold resource, poor environment for humans. Um, that's why the only people who live there are teams of scientists decked out in a fancy protected research station. Um, but that's not to say that humans in the past haven't at least checked out the place mm -hmm. once in a while. And that brings us to this wonderful April 2021 paper 
by Priscilla Wehi and colleagues that looked at Maori oral history, scientific knowledge, and linguistics to discover that their ancestors may have traveled to Antarctica at some time around the early 600s AD. Now, I, I say ancestors because Aotearoa, or New Zealand, uh, wouldn't be settled until 1200 to 1350 AD, but Maori oral history happens to go back much further than that to the voyages of a man named uh, Uti Rangaroa, who lived on the island of Rarotonga in the Cook Islands. Uh, during that time, he was sailing with his crew far to the south, where they appear to have entered the Antarctic Ocean and seen sea ice. And we can be confident of this because of the language concern. Uh, the sailors named this ocean Te Tau Uka Apia, which means sea foaming like an arrowroot, um, which is a plant in the yam lineage that turns into a snow-like powder when it's crushed. Now, going further into the accounts, they describe what appear to be icebergs, barren rocks, bull kelp, and marine mammals. And the oral accounts all point to the direction of a sighting of the Antarctic coast. Now, fascinatingly, the Maori have crafted a number of wooden carved posts called uh, uh, Puwaka Iro, which I, I show here. Um, and uh, some of these depict uh, Uti Rangaroa's journeys. And one in particular, which is this specific one, um, represents uh, Tamara Reti. Uh, who was this protector of the Southern Oceans, who was a, a legendary figure, um, and is located at the very southernmost end of New Zealand, you know, as if in reference to the fact of this Southern Ocean full of ice. Um, the authors state very clearly that much of Maori oral history has yet to have been fully shared with the world, and through collaboration with Maori academics, it's possible that more details about Polynesian, about this Polynesian journey to Antarctica will be revealed. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's neat, you know, a, yeah. a little tour that can be added to the story of the Polynesian and thus the human expansion, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. there were people as far back as 1400 years or so that were sailing to Antarctica, mm -hmm. you know, long before, you know, the great explorers of historical times. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, yeah. And you know what? Who knows how many other people may have made attempts to explore this way that we just don't know about. Mm -hmm. um, I often wonder if some of the people who have settled South America may have attempted to look around further south. Yeah, you know, that's, that's true. <laughs> it's an interesting thing to think about, um, but who knows? Um, but yeah, uh, with that, this concludes our Humanity a Prologue update special. Um, we covered a lot of ground in just a short period of time, but it just goes to show that mm -hmm. research in human origins and evolution is never ending. Mm -hmm. It's always open to change. Some great and others small and in just a year's time i mean how much new research has already come out right it's amazing so yeah i'm going to raise my glass and here's to another year of discovery for us to explore in a future updates episode mm -hmm. <laughs> so what do you think about that albert any closing thoughts from your end <laughs> uh no i i think um you know, I definitely expected the updates to be quite extensive but uh yeah the, the sheer amount um, that you've presented here it is it is mind-blowing how how much has happened uh, in just one year and i'm sure that there'll be plenty more to come <laughs> definitely and uh, i certainly look forward to all of it um but in that case uh, we are done here um i'd like to acknowledge our good friends henry and alicia for their contributions to this series of course henry did music for us and alicia did the color scheme for albert's avatar um we are on Twitter at Time and Clates if you want to follow us for updates, mostly about you know episode releases and whatnot. Um, but more likely, you're watching us on YouTube on our channel through Time and Clades. You are more than welcome to subscribe and see our playlists where uh, we upload both um, Dinosaurs the Second Chapter and Humanity a Prologue in complete playlists, which you can watch. Well, I should say Humanity a Prologues is now complete. Um, and you can follow that from the beginning, and we're almost about done with Albert's series as mm -hmm. well. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, if you have any questions for us, feel free to leave us comments. We always appreciate that. But we do have an email as well, timeandclades at gmail.com, which you can you know send to us, and we'll do our best to answer them whenever possible. Um, and, of course, we will post in the description a link to a Google Doc with all the references for this episode. Um, there were quite a number of stories that I covered here today, and each of them in the order that I talked about in the series will be put there for you all to explore. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, uh, we are now on Patreon. We are patreon.com slash time and clades. 
Uh, this is a recent experiment with us from just this month. Um, and of course, uh, we are grateful to our current patron at the moment, uh, my sister, Julie Gaines, who has helped out for the tier uh, where she is um, giving a shout out for this episode. Um, but if any of you all are interested, you are more than welcome to go to our Patreon and look at our tier lists. Um, we accept anything from a dollar beyond. Um, and your contributions will help us, of course, continue this series and develop new projects and expansions in the near future. Now, with that, we are done. Um, I believe next week will be our July news episode. Is that correct? Yep, uh, that is correct. Uh, so, yes, we'll have another um, episode full of news for all of you, uh, this time uh, focusing on recent news, and it's not necessarily going to uh, be related to uh, human origins, but uh, you know, it's going to be a real grab bag of stuff probably, as, as always, and uh, yeah, we always look forward to making those. <laughs> Definitely, and then after that, of course, will be the finale for Dinosaurs, the second chapter. Uh, that I is correct. That is. And that's all. That's uh, that's exciting, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are going to conclude uh, Dinosaurs, the second chapter next. Uh, and yeah, after the news episode. And yes, uh, that, that'll be an exciting one to, to get to. Uh, so the main focus of the episode will be about uh, passeriform birds, uh, so-called perching birds. Uh, and they include everything from, oh, I don't know, like sparrows to finches to swallows to uh, uh, mockingbirds to robins to uh, um, tanagers to uh, all, all, kinds of, all kinds of birds. In fact, the ge generic kind of bird that you might picture in your head when you think of a bird is probably modeled on a... Um, a passeriform bird, and uh, they account for 60% of all bird diversity today, and uh, it'll be interesting to tell uh, some of their stories in that episode. Um, and with that, we will finish uh, covering all of uh, modern bird diversity, and so that will be the end of Dinosaurs, the second chapter, um, at least until the updates episode for that. <laughs> yeah, oh, that sounds exciting, and uh, we definitely look forward to seeing that for sure. Um, but as always, we appreciate all of you sticking with us, and we hope you enjoyed this update special. Mm -hmm. Again, we hope to do more of these on a at least yearly basis, but if you think that that's either too long of a wait, or if you have any ideas for that, you are more than welcome to comment on that. But that yeah. is the plan that we are going for. Um, but hey, until next time, thank you all again, and we will see you next time. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. <laughs>